questions. We now move on to the next item on business. Yes, point of order from Mike Rumbles. 3.1a. This says a bill shall on introduction be accompanied by a written statement signed by the presiding officer, which shall a indicate whether or not, in the presiding officer's view, the provisions of the bill would be in the legislative competence of the Parliament. Presiding officer, we are all aware that during the recess, the Scottish Government published its draft bill on another referendum aiming to the breakup of the United Kingdom. This draft bill, if it were introduced as a bill, is universally recognised as being out with the competence of this Scottish Parliament. In such an unprecedented case, the standing orders are silent as to the effect, to the effect of the presiding officer's written confirmation that the bill would lie outside the competence of the Scottish Parliament. I am sure that it would be immensely helpful to all members of the Scottish Parliament to be aware of the effect, and I stress the word, the effect of such a ruling by the presiding officer. For instance, would the effect be for such a bill to proceed through its stages to a vote if it was presented, or would it be referred immediately to the Supreme Court for a ruling? Your guidance on this matter would be extremely helpful. Thank you, Anne. Can I thank the member for advance notice of the point of order? Rule 9.3.1 states that a bill on introduction shall be accompanied by a written statement which indicates whether or not, in my view, the provisions of the bill would be within the legislative competence of the Parliament. Where I consider any of the provisions to be out with our competence, I must provide reasons for that view. If I am of the view that a bill is out with competence, it can still be introduced and parliamentary scrutiny would proceed on that basis. Let me make it clear, I provide this advice to help members and the public understand the process, but I am not and will not express a view on any specific bill before it is introduced. The competence of any bill passed by the Parliament can be challenged by the law officers in the four-week period before the bill is submitted for royal assent. Ultimately, any challenge taken after that period would be for the courts to determine. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 2077 in the name of Angela Constance on building a fairer Scotland. It takes all of us. I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to open this debate today on a fairer Scotland and on the action plan that was published uh, earlier this month. And I'm sure the whole chamber will support the, the central contention in today's motion that it genuinely it takes all of us to build a fairer Scotland. And I very much look forward to debating with colleagues uh, across this chamber about how we can work together to achieve this. In terms of where we are and what we have already delivered, there is indeed much to be upbeat and optimistic about. A few examples would be that Scotland outperforms the UK on youth employment and women's employment. Over 25,000 people have started a modern apprenticeship in each of the last five years. We have the second highest proportion of employees paid the living wage or more at 80.5%, just behind the, the southeast of England at 81.6%, and the number of Scots-based accredited living wage employers uh, is now 595. But of course, uh, there is still much more to do. Uh, around one in six people in this country are still living in poverty. Uh, In-work poverty has been increasing, uh, with more than half, 58% of the working age uh, adult population uh, who live in poverty are actually living in households uh, where someone uh, is in work. And I have to say that I'm somewhat disappointed that the Conservative amendment today uh, has overlooked this key aspect of poverty, uh, one that is made worse by cuts to uh, working welfare over the last six years. So that's why, presiding officer, the Fairer Scotland Action Plan is so uh, important. It features 50 concrete actions that this government will take in this parliamentary term uh, to alleviate poverty and tackle uh, inequality. And the plan makes clear our ambition for a fair, smart, inclusive Scotland uh, by 2030, where everyone can feel at home, where poverty rates are amongst the, the lowest in Europe, and where there is a genuine uh, equality of opportunity for everyone. 
And we know that the government cannot deliver this ambition on its own. Uh, it does indeed take all of us to build a fairer Scotland, and that's why we place such emphasis uh, on working closely with people and communities, with businesses and employers, with the third sector and with public bodies to learn from best practice uh, and to drive change. All of us uh, here in this chamber today will, will need to play our part two. Uh, and I very much welcome the ideas, the innovation, uh, and indeed the challenge uh, that the Chamber will no doubt offer uh, in the course of this debate uh, and other debates in the months and years ahead. But I am pleased that the plan has been warmly welcomed by stakeholders. Uh, Alistair Pringle, uh, Director of the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Scotland, uh, called the plan a bold vision for a fairer Scotland and made clear that the EHRC will play its full part in making the plan's uh, ambition a reality. Sarah Jackson, Chief Executive of Working Families, described the action plan as a great step forward uh, for fair work in Scotland. And Dr Sally Witcher, OBE, Chief Executive of Inclusion Scotland, said, there is much to be welcomed in the plan that could have a positive impact on disabled people's lives. But, she added, the challenge now is to transform paper commitments into reality in order to achieve the reduction in inequality and poverty uh, that all of us uh, want to see. So while the action plan is important in itself, it's delivering on the action themselves that counts. And that's why we've committed to a progress report uh, in 2019 to set out uh, where we're doing well and where we could do uh, better. However, I recognise that the Labour Amendment has asked for annual reporting and reflecting on the importance of the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, uh, I am willing to accept this. President Officer, we know that delivering on our ambition won't be easy, but if we succeed, uh, we will all uh, benefit because a fairer country uh, is good for everyone. The international uh, evidence is clear that income inequality undermines educational opportunity, restricts skills development and reduces uh, social mobility. And it also limits growth too, because according to the, the OECD, rising income inequality between 1990 and 2010 reduced UK economic growth uh, by nine percentage points. So we know that poverty has massive costs for all governments. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation suggests that the, the cost of poverty to the, the UK public purse is £78 billion each year. And this implies that the cost to Scotland is in the region between £6 to £7 billion. And of course, there are many different ways to consider uh, the cost of poverty and these estimates do not include some of the wider cost to society. But what is clear from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation research is that we spend a significant amount of money making up for the damage that poverty does to, to people's lives. So while the UK government presiding officer may think it's smart to cut £12 billion from its welfare budget, in the long run, that decision is likely to backfire with increasing costs from higher levels of poverty and indeed weaker economic growth uh, because of widening uh, inequality. So in contrast, uh, we in Scotland have a specific ambition to reduce poverty uh, and through our inclusive growth policies, share the proceeds of growth more widely. And if we can do this, uh, Scotland will not only have a stronger economy, uh, but a, a stronger society too. So the Fairer Scotland Action Plan contains 50 actions that are ambitious, affordable, achievable, and it's based on what we heard from 7,000 people who took part in 200 Fairer Scotland conversations from Dumfries to Stornoway. And the plan doesn't include actions we'd like to take but can't because the power to do so is reserved, and it isn't an exhaustive list of actions covering uh, everything that the Scottish Government uh, is already doing. And I do know that the Conservatives had suggested in their amendment that there's not enough 
about racial discrimination uh, in the plan. And I want to reassure Mr Tompkins that this government is absolutely determined to advance race equality in Scotland. And our race equality framework has been developed specifically to address the barriers that prevent people from minority ethnic communities uh, from realising their potential. And implementing the framework is, I'm pleased to say, a key element uh, of the Fairer Scotland uh, Action Plan. The plan sets out the, the key actions we will take in this parliamentary term, but it also sets out our commitment to take long-term action uh, to change our society and make it a fairer and more equal place to live. As politicians, we know that it takes courage not to just go for the quick wins, uh, but to focus on the long term. Uh, building a fairer Scotland is inevitably uh, going to be a long-term effort and it will mean that all of us uh, across political parties will need to work together uh, to achieve it. I want to focus in particular on one theme in the action plan and that's bringing about an end to uh, child poverty which absolutely is a long-term cha challenge but it is a challenge uh, that we're committed to doing absolutely uh, everything uh, within uh, our power and our eyes are very firmly uh, on the ambition uh, to eradicate child poverty because poverty for anyone whether they have children or not whether they are young or old means waking up every day facing insecurity uncertainty and absolutely impossible decisions about money. It means facing marginalisation and even <coughs> discrimination uh, simply because of your financial situation. And it can have long-term impacts uh, on your prospects uh, and the places that you live in. But poverty for children can have effects that last a lifetime. And that's why it's so important to act now. And the plan contains a, a range of actions to do just that, increasing childcare provision, tackling the poverty premium, delivering on the baby box of essential basic supplies uh, and addressing the attainment gap. And the child poverty bill that I will be bringing forward in this parliamentary year uh, sets out our ambition. We've already consulted uh, on new 2030 targets to make significant reductions in child poverty and we'll provide more detail uh, about our plans uh, in the, the coming months. And again, I note that the Conservative Amendment says that any poverty indicator uh, must include some measurement of household costs. And on this, uh, I absolutely agree, because that's why our child poverty targets and our other poverty uh, measurements take housing costs into account uh, as they are one of the major costs faced uh, by low-income households. And our targets uh, are actually more ambitious than the 2020 targets that were scrapped by uh, the UK government precisely because they do this. And Yes, certainly. Adam Tompkins. Uh, very, very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Uh, do I understand it correctly then, uh, Cabinet Minister, that the Scottish Government um, agrees with the Scottish Conservatives that poverty cannot meaningfully be measured by reference to income alone, but that costs must be taken into account as well as income? Cabinet Secretary. I suppose I'm somewhat disappointed that uh, Mr Tompkins hasn't appreciated that underpinning our current child poverty strategy and our current measurements um, of poverty that we already include uh, housing costs. And in our consultation uh, on the child poverty bill that we're going forward with, uh, again, uh, we lay that out because while uh, uh, poverty indicators and poverty measurements that are before housing costs can be useful in terms of international uh, comparators. We absolutely uh, agree with the point and have put in practice the point that you have to include household costs. And to demonstrate that, one of the reasons that child poverty in Scotland, uh, while too high, um, is lower than the UK is because of our investment in affordable housing. So I'm glad that the Conservatives have caught up with the position of this government. It is somewhat sad uh, that the UK Tory government uh, don't recognise this point uh, about you know, affordable housing and how that has to be part um, of a measurement. But fundamentally, that they don't uh, recognise that more than anything else, uh, income drives poverty, or the lack of income drives poverty. 
And that's where we have a fundamental uh, disagreement uh, with the UK government, because in scrapping these statutory uh, income targets, which were less ambitious than the ones that we are proposing, I believe, presiding officer, that the UK government have tried to sweep child poverty under the carpet. And I'm also uh, disappointed and at times quite disgusted uh, in the way in which they characterise poverty by ignoring uh, income, they tend to focus on other aspects uh, of poverty to try and imply that there is something about poverty that is about a lifestyle choice. And we have to recognise and stand firm that you can't have an anti-poverty strategy that does not recognise uh, the importance uh, of income. President officer, before I close, I want to focus uh, quickly on three key actions to, to tackle poverty uh, more generally. The first action uh, in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan uh, is to introduce a new socio-economic duty on public authorities uh, in 2017. Uh, Scotland will be the first and the only part of the UK to have such a duty. Uh, the socio-economic duty was a dormant part of the UK Equality Act, a piece of the act that Theresa May refused to introduce. But Scotland, now that we have the powers, will indeed introduce the socio-economic duty because ensuring that public bodies take account place utmost priority on tackling socio-disadvantage and to take that uh, seriously when they are making all major decisions, all major strategic decisions and decisions about resources is one that we believe is fundamentally important. And I will be consulting on the detail about how we go about that and how we do that shortly. But the Scottish Government, I want to ensure Chamber, will itself be bound by the duty and we uh, intend to be a model uh, of absolute best practice. Secondly, uh, President Officer, uh, we will introduce a new £29 million innovation fund, uh, including £12.5 million from the European Social Fund. And we know that many of the best ideas come from communities uh, and uh, the third sector. So over the next two years, this new programme will enable them to design, test and deliver innovative approaches to reduce poverty and tackle inequality. We'll also provide start-up funding for three new organisations across Scotland uh, modelled on the Poverty Truth uh, Commission. The Commission has been very successful in getting the voices of people who have that experience of poverty, that lived experience of poverty, into the national debate. And now we need to, to help this continue at a local level too. And we've already agreed to, to fund the, the Dundee Partnership uh, to take one commission uh, forward locally. So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, uh, I want to uh, invite everyone in this chamber to help Scotland become a fairer, more prosperous and cohesive uh, country. Uh, we know that a fairer Scotland is a country that builds on the, the assets uh, of its people and the assets of its communities. It's a country that gives everyone uh, a chance to achieve their potential and to live long, healthy and fulfilling lives. And above all, it's a country that we're all proud uh, to call home. So, Presiding officer, it does indeed take all of us uh, to build a fairer Scotland and I pledge to take my part, to play my part and I very much look forward to working with colleagues uh, across the chamber to do so. So thank you, presiding officer, and I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I invite all members to press their request to speak buttons if they wish to participate and I call on Adam Tompkins to open for the Conservatives. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, we support the government motion uh, today. We agree that poverty must be reduced. We agree that this will require government to work with business uh, and the third sector, and indeed with opposition parties, uh, that the attainment gap must be tackled, that mental health care must be improved, and that housing should be affordable and warm. Our amendment today, which I formally move, presiding officer, removes uh, not one word from the government motion, but seeks to add to it. Because uh, on these benches, we consider that the government, for all its efforts, will not achieve a fairer Scotland unless it is willing to take on challenges it has thus far rather shied away from. And I want to draw attention in these remarks in particular to three areas where we think that too little is said in the Fairer Scotland uh, Action Plan. Employment, uh, racial and religious intolerance, which the Cabinet Secretary referred to in her uh, remarks a few moments ago, uh, and uh, decentralisation and local empowerment. First, we consider that in a fairer Scotland, the employment growth rate would not lag badly behind that of every other nation and region in the United Kingdom. Likewise, in a fairer Scotland, 
the employment rate would be going up as it is in the rest of the United Kingdom and not down as it is here uh, under the SNP. The figures on this are alarming, presiding officer. The employment growth rate in Scotland is lower than the northeast of England, the northwest of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. London has an employment growth rate that dwarfs Scotland. The East Midlands of England, hardly the most affluent part of the country, has a growth rate three times Scotland's. Jobs growth for women in employment in Scotland is also poor. Since 2007, female employment has grown by only 5% in Scotland, compared with more than 10% in the UK as a whole. And the gender pay gap is also wider in Scotland than it is elsewhere in the UK. Is that a fairer Scotland, a more inclusive Scotland? Compare this with the Conservatives' record in government. Since 2010, unemployment in the United Kingdom has fallen by 30% and long-term unemployment by 35%. The number of people claiming unemployment benefits has fallen to its lowest level since 1975. There are now more than 31.8 million people in work in Britain, more than ever before, and up by nearly 3 million since 2010. There are more disabled people in work today. 360,000 people with a disability have found work in Britain in the last two years who were not previously in employment. There are more women in work in Britain now than ever before, and fully three quarters of this growth in employment in Britain since 2010 has been in full-time work. 95% of it in full-time work or in self-employment. Yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Tompkins. I wonder if he would recognise that women's employment in Scotland is consistently within the top five uh, in Europe. I wonder if he would also recognise uh, the fact that the pay gap, while persistent, uh, and we still have much work to do to tackle it, uh, is actually fallen in Scotland and is actually lower uh, in Scotland than it is across the UK. Uh, the figures are approximately 9.4% pay gap for the UK. In Scotland, it is around something like 7.4%. Uh, uh, and would he also recognise that in terms of the, the last labour market statistics that we realised that we had the biggest uh, quarterly increase in employment on record and that employment across the piece is now uh, over 50,000 above uh, our pre-recession income. Mr. Tolkien. I'm very happy to recognise all of those facts, but you know, this is hardly the first time that from these benches we have raised the problem. Uh, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that it's a problem, that the employment growth rate in Scotland is woefully poor in comparison with every other region and nation of the United Kingdom. And yet we never hear a response from the Scottish Government about what they propose to do to tackle the poor employment growth rate that Scotland uh, suffers from. This isn't just about fairness, presiding officer, it's about tackling poverty itself. As the Joseph Rantree Foundation so clearly said in the same document that the Cabinet Secretary quoted from earlier, um, uh, for those who can, work represents the best route out of poverty. And that's exactly what we on these benches uh, believe. So why are things... Let, let me finish the point about employment and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly give way. So why are things so much worse in Scotland than they are in the rest of the UK? Has it perhaps got something to do with the fog of uncertainty hanging over the Scottish economy as a result of the SNP's endless campaigning on separation? Has it perhaps got something to do with Skills Development Scotland, a Scottish Government quango having its budget cut by more than £25 million since 2011? Has it perhaps got something to do with the low number of apprenticeships in the Scottish economy? There are twice as many per head of population in England as there are here in Scotland. Or has it perhaps got something to do with the 152,000 college places that the SNP has cut, de-skilling the Scottish workforce at a time when employers are crying out for precisely the opposite? Just last week, the Scottish Chamber of Commerce talked about the urgent need to grow Scotland's productivity and reported that businesses are saying that there are significant opportunities to grow employment in Scotland, not least uh, in the digital sector. I'm happy to give way Minister to the Jean Minister. Freeman. Freeman. Thank, thank you very much. Will Mr Tompkins recognise the following things? That first of all, Joseph Rowntree, and he and I have had this conversation before, Joseph Rowntree, in pointing to the importance of work, pointed to the importance of well-paid, properly rewarded, fair work, which is, of course, part of our fair work agreement and framework. Will he also recognise that any fog of uncertainty that may exist is actually a fog of uncertainty caused by Brexit yeah. and particularly caused by his government at Westminster's failure, utter failure, to point to any route that we might collectively take out of that? And will he also recognise that we have the gold standard in apprenticeship programmes because our apprenticeships are linked to employment, unlike those run by the Westminster government? 
Mr. Jumpkins. The, 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 the idea that the problems in the Scottish economy, which are not shared by the rest of the United Kingdom, are caused because of the decision of 17.5 million British people to leave the European Union and not caused by the, endless, by the SNP's endless banging on about independence is, frankly, for the birds. I thought the Minister was capable of better than that. If the SNP need to be doing more to address work and worklessness in Scotland, so too in our amendment, and the Cabinet Secretary was good enough to recognise this in her remarks a few moments ago, we, uh, we uh, consider that there should be more said in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan about race uh, and religion. Now, we all know that the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister for Social Security have made gender equality a high priority, and they are right to have done so, but not at the expense of race and religion, which in comparison with gender are all too often brushed under the carpet in Scotland. In July, it was reported that a study funded by the Scottish Government found that the Jewish community in Scotland feels increasingly isolated and fearful. It's becoming more common for Scotland's Jews to keep their Jewishness secret. I declare an interest, presiding officer, in that my wife and our four children are Jewish. Many of the hundreds of Israelis in Scotland hide their nationality and do not speak Hebrew in public. Numerous respondents have told SCOJEC, the Scottish Council for Jewish Communities, that they have stopped attending synagogue uh, because of fear of anti-Semitism, that they have been the victims of anti-Semitic jokes or social media posts, or that they have felt victimised for being Jewish. Now, Angela Constance said at the time that this report was published that she would give full consideration to it, and I welcome that, but where in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan is there any reference to it? The Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, whilst they are supportive of the Fairer Scotland agenda, wrote to me last week to record their concern that of the 50 actions outlined in the plan, only one is centred on race equality. And even that, the commitment to implement the race equality framework for Scotland is simply a reheating or a repetition of a commitment already made uh, last March. The third area where we think that much more needs to be done in order to create a genuinely fairer Scotland is decentralisation. As the leader of Glasgow City Council urged in the Times newspaper on Friday, Scotland's cities are crying out for greater devolution in order to allow them to grow their local economies. This is happening in England. It's happening elsewhere in the world. It's happening in the Netherlands, in Germany, in France, in Canada and Australia, but not, not here in Scotland. The Minister is the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Social Security and Equalities. Since the election and her appointment to that position, we've had several important debates in this chamber on government motions concerned with the social security and equalities aspects of her brief, but we've had nothing, no government time on communities, which speaks volumes, I fear, for just how little the SNP cares about localism and communities and about devolution within Scotland. A fairer Scotland would be a radically more decentralised country. I'm afraid I'm running out of time because of the length of the interventions that I've already taken. In a fairer Scotland, our cities wouldn't be failing even to play catch-up with Manchester or Birmingham. They'd be leading the way, blazing a fresh trail of local empowerment. The leaders of our cities recognise this potential. They are straining at the leash to foster growth, to create employment and to make Scotland cities more attractive places to do business from the bottom up. They want to take decisions and set the strategy at a local le level to help their communities prosper. But they also recognise uh, that as drivers of the national economy, our cities risk falling behind their UK equivalents, which have benefited from a targeted programme of devolution and decentralisation since 2010. Where there is clarity and consensus on the decentralisation agenda in England, there is only uncertainty in Scotland. And this, council leaders argue, threatens to exacerbate the emerging gap between Scotland's cities and UK counterparts. Now, I've talked about three things that the SNP are not doing that they would need to do to create a fairer Scotland. But there are also some things that I think the SNP are doing which they should stop. They should abandon their plans to make Scotland the highest taxed part of the UK. They should repeal their hated and illegal named persons legislation and replace it with a crisis family fund, providing tailored support to those with the most complex needs. They should reverse the dismal slide in standards in our schools. They should address the shameful fact that a lower proportion of students from our most deprived communities go to universities than is the case in England. In England, it's one child in five from the most deprived communities. In Scotland, it's one child in 10. Just today, 
Fresh statistics show that bursary support for students in Scotland has been almost halved. How does that contribute to a fairer Scotland? And the SNP should reverse the 20% cut in last year's budget in drug and alcohol funding, a cut they implemented despite the fact that 2015 saw the highest number of drugs-related deaths in Scotland on record, more than double the figure for 2005. But more than anything else, presiding officer, the SNP must, as a matter of urgency, address the fact that growth in the Scottish economy persistently lags behind the UK as a whole. In the last year, the UK economy grew by more than 2%, Scotland's by only 0.7%. If only they'd focus on these tasks rather than sabre-rattling about an unwanted, divisive and unnecessary second independence referendum, then Scotland really would have the chance of being a fairer country. Yes. Alex Rowley, to open for Labour. Thanks, President Officer. In moving the Labour amendment today, can I first of all welcome the Fair of Scotland action plan and say that whilst we have concerns over emissions from the plan and the questions over the way it is to be delivered and funded, the general direction is something that, that, that we will support. Our amendment, therefore, is aimed at being supportive and I hope demonstrates Scottish Labour's wish to work with the government to do all within the powers of this parliament to tackle the unacceptable levels of low income and deep-rooted deprivation and inequality that exists in 21st century Scotland. The 50-point action plan will not on its own be able to eradicate poverty, but if delivered will make a big difference for tens if not hundreds of thousands of individuals and Scottish families. And that's why we believe this Parliament should take ownership of this plan and receive regular feedback on progress being made and be able to scrutinise and debate that progress. This afternoon, I listened carefully to what Adam Tompkins had to say, and I conclude that not only do the Scottish Tories have a rather simplistic view of the causes of poverty, but more they are in complete denial about their role in increasing the levels of poverty in Scotland over these last six years. The, in the inhumane bedroom tax, the flawed welfare reforms, the sanctions regime and the failure to invest in our economy are all contributors to the rising levels of poverty since 2010. And today the Scottish Tories could join the consensus in this Parliament and condemn the Westminster Tory government's decision to scrap the child poverty targets introduced by the last Labour government. But they won't. Let us also be clear, austerity is a key driver of economic failure and deepening inequality in our country. So if the Scottish Tories are serious about addressing the big issues, then I suggest they oppose any further welfare reforms that will drive more and more people into poverty and campaign for an end to the failed austerity policies of their government in Westminster that has increased debt and driven down living standards for millions of working people. But to the SNP Edinburgh government, I say we must stand up against austerity, not just in words, but in actions. Let us have an honest discussion about how we fund public services. The failure to scrap the council tax is just one example of a failure of our government in Edinburgh to find a more fair way of funding public services. It is a failure that is costing tens of thousands of jobs, whilst vital community services buckle under the sustained cuts to our communities. So can I say the first big test of this government's intention to implement this plan will be their budget to be published later this year. If it's been widely reported, the biggest losers from that budget will be local communities through austerity cuts to local public services then believe me, inequality will continue to grow in Scotland. Even at this stage, I would appeal to the Finance Secretary to get round the table with other parties in this Parliament and have an open discussion on how we can stop the most severe cuts to public services and how we can build a new public service reform partnership so that all levels of government are joined up together in addressing the major challenges facing our communities in 21st century Scotland. 
Actions speak louder than words, and we need action to invest and regenerate our economies at the local, the regional and the national level. The action plan states it takes all of us to build a fairer Scotland, a point the Minister Cabinet Secretary has made, and one that is true. But let me say it takes political leadership, strong political leadership, and a willingness to be bold. In Scotland, we spend billions of pounds within the private sector on procurement of goods and services. Let us say that we will use the procurement of goods and services to build a new social and economic partnership in every region of Scotland that will deliver local labour agreements, local skills programmes and an apprenticeship programme in every local authority area of Scotland. A national house building programme that, with local delivery plans to address the unacceptable housing crisis we have in our country, whilst delivering local jobs, skills and apprenticeships. We are making progress on the living wage, but not at the pace that we need to do if we are to increase incomes by the levels that we must to tackle poverty in Scotland. So we must use the procurement as a tool and we must commit to ending zero-hour contracts and the growing use of employment agency practices up and down the country. And let us commit to ending the scourge of fuel poverty, not just with words, but with a clear national plan setting out measurable targets year on year and linking to regional economic strategies with a clear target for jobs, skills and apprenticeships. Joined up government, bold leadership and a knowledge that we must build new partnerships, a new understanding with all level of government as equals, with business and industry, with the dynamic Scottish third sector and with community-based action plans the length and breadth of our country. I look forward to reading the responses to the social security consultation currently underway, because as the Poverty Alliance have said we must oppose, we must open up the processes to the experiences of those who live in poverty. And I say that we should build a national consensus against poverty and for action to eradicate it. One of the responses is from the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, and they call for a top-up on child benefit of £5 a week, which they say is projected to reduce child poverty in Scotland by 12 per cent, meaning 30,000 fewer children in poverty than would otherwise be the case. As the Children and Young People's Commissioner's Office has stated, child hunger has been linked with depression, suicidal thoughts and late adolescence and early adulthood. Is it not a national disgrace that children in Scotland go regularly hungry in 2016? We have the opportunity to bring together all aspects of Scottish Government, Scottish business, Scottish industry, Scottish civic society and Scottish people to galvanise against poverty. An action plan against poverty let us show the leadership required and build consensus and build a task force that is required to once and all for all beat poverty in Scotland. Thank you. I call on Alison Johnson to open for the Green Party. Um, Presiding Officer, I very much welcome the Government motion's commitment to achieving a fairer Scotland, a commitment which I'm sure we all share. The motion welcomes the publication of the Fairer Scotland Action Plan and it proposes a number of actions that are very welcome indeed. The proposed return of a socio-economic duty, the restoration of housing benefit for young people aged 18 to 21, and the new Poverty and Inequality Commission are all important steps. But I can't help but feel that the omission of tax is a glaring one. Unless we use new powers over tax to achieve some redistribution of income, wealth and life chances, these 50 measures, worthy and welcome though they are, will not lead to the fairer Scotland that the Scottish Government aspires to. Of course, tax changes alone will not fix poverty and inequality. But for progressive rate change not to make the Scottish Government's top 50 is a new kind of tax dodging from the Scottish Government. The only two of the top 50 fairness actions relating to tax refer to changes to council tax rebates. Now, these are welcome, 
But Naomi Eisenstadt told Nicola Sturgeon to be bold on tax reform. And the Commission on Local Tax Reform told us that the present council tax system must end. The Scottish Green Party's tax plans in the election were clear and credible. They suggested ending the regressive and outdated council tax and replacing it with a modern property tax in local control, which would mean the majority of households would pay less. This is a plan that would make housing more affordable and raise more money for public services. Our income tax plans would have reduced Scotland's inequality four times more than the Scottish Government's changes last year and raised more money for public services while leaving everyone earning below the median income paying less in tax. Now, taken together, these tax changes would shift tax from income to wealth, and the Scottish Government's own figures show that wealth inequality is dramatically more skewed compared to the distribution of income. So it's time to see progressive tax changes as part of the plan for a fairer Scotland. And that's why I'm seeking to amend the motion to call for progressive taxation of income and wealth. Presiding officer, I'd now like to move on to discuss social security. Two decades of UK welfare reform has warped our social security system, in some cases fostering insecurity and actively undermining people's welfare. The system is too often not a springboard into social and economic inclusion. It's looking less like a safety net and often looks like a system for bullying people into low-paid, insecure employment. Now, Scottish Greens were the only party to stand on a manifesto that promised to stop sanctions operating through devolved employment programmes. Thousands of people agreed, and I'm very pleased that the SNP government has listened and taken action. Ending sanctions is part of a broader direction of travel towards the Scottish Green Party's preferred approach to social security, a universal basic income. Now, this is a transformational idea where all citizens would be paid a basic, unconditional income, enough to meet everyone's basic needs. And because everyone receives the citizen's income, it would remove the stigma of benefits and promote solidarity. Women in particular would benefit from a citizen's income. The late Scottish economist, Professor Ailsa Mackay, was a lifelong advocate. She made it clear that a citizen's income would recognise the diverse role of women as wives, mothers, carers and workers. Now, the Scotland Act doesn't devolve sufficient powers to deliver a universal basic income. To make this a reality, perhaps would require independence, or at the very least, a sea change in the UK benefits system. But we can make some movement towards it in the way that people apply for the new benefits. I welcome the pledge to undertake targeted benefit uptake work to help people claim the benefits they are entitled to. And to better understand the barriers that prevent people from claiming benefits, but more radical action is needed to ensure that those who need benefits actually get them. Universal basic income wouldn't require a traditional benefits application, and it would be paid automatically to all citizens. And we can mirror this in the new Scottish social security system. Whenever someone applies for an individual benefit, they could be automatically considered for all other benefits for which they might be eligible. And given the inherent complexity of the benefits system, the onus to make a benefit claim should not necessarily be on the individual, particularly when that individual may be stressed, vulnerable, unwell, out of work. And the Scottish Government should consider this approach if it is serious about doing more to ensure that people claim the benefits they are entitled to, which was one of the independent poverty advisors' challenges. Very effective measures to raise awareness of benefit entitlement and help people to apply for benefits already exist. The Healthier Wealthier Children Initiative, chief amongst them. And I was glad to have the Scottish Government's commitment to rolling out the Healthier Wealthier Children project in response to my call to the Cabinet Secretary for Health. That's a poverty reduction strategy that's proven to work. It puts money in the pockets of pregnant women and new families just when they need it most. Trusted frontline NHS workers, like midwives and health visitors, are ideally placed to refer vulnerable women and families to high quality local money advice services. And of course they need the resources and the capacity to enable them to do so. But that's why I'm asking, seeking to amend the motion today to recognise the importance of projects like Healthier Wealthier Children 
in working towards the fairer Scotland that we all want to see. So I very much welcome the Scottish Government's aim to achieve a fairer Scotland and its 50 fairness actions, but they are only a start. Devolution has entered a new phase. The Scottish Parliament has more powers than ever before, greater powers over income tax, and to start building a new Scottish social security system, a system that we can be proud of. And having argued for these powers, we will not be credible as a parliament unless we have serious and open-minded discussions about how we use them. It is now time for parliament to seriously discuss a more progressive system of income and wealth taxation to achieve that fairer Scotland. In closing, presiding officer, um, I will be pleased to support the government's motion today and to support the Labour amendment. While there, are, uh, while there is content in the Conservative um, amendment that I do agree with, particularly um, in ensuring that a fairer Scotland has to look at issues that perhaps currently haven't received the attention that they deserve and that the fact that we need to move to a more decentralised country with greater devolution to its cities, I am somewhat astonished to to read Adam Tompkins' assertion uh, uh, that puts uh, addiction, family breakdown and worklessness as underlying causes of poverty. And I would suggest to Mr Tompkins, and perhaps he will agree with me, that addiction, family breakdown and indeed even worklessness are sometimes the effects of poverty. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. We now move to the open speeches of six minutes, please, and I call on George Adam to be followed by Annie Wales. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I'm glad to be speaking during this debate because, once again, it gives me an opportunity to come at this from a very personal and local perspective. Now, something I no doubt many of you will be surprised about. But one of the things I do want to bring up and address is some of the things that Mr Tompkins said when he was talking about disabled uh, disabil people with disabilities and going to work. You know, he was in the committee when actually Mr Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland stated that 48% of those in poverty are actual disabled people. 48% and all that in the back of six years of Tory welfare reform and a Tory government in Westminster. So I'll take absolutely no lessons on where we're going forward from anyone in the Conservative benches. But, as I said, presiding officer, I'll go back to personal and local perspective. And during my time as Paisley's MSP, I've discussed the fact that my constituency can be used as a template for the rest of Scotland. On one hand, you have people getting on with their lives and are able to achieve their many life dreams and goals. But like many other communities in Scotland, there are those struggling day to day with ongoing challenges of poverty. As the Cabinet Secretary Angela Conson said, one in six are living in poverty. And we all know that the Scottish index of multiple deprivation figures indicate that parts of Fergusley Park are amongst the most deprived in Scotland. But that's not the complete story, presiding officer, of that community or of Paisley. For the past 20 years, Stacey and I have lived in Seat Hill Road in the east end of our town. According to the recent SIM SIMD figures, the very street we live on is an area of deprivation. David McCartney, my constituency office manager, is two streets away and is regarded as living in poverty. We have stayed in these areas for the same number of years and that is not the Seat Hill we recognise. The same figures state that parts of Fergusley Park are the worst areas of deprivation in Scotland. And my family are from Fergusley originally and I'm proud of my roots. But what I'm trying to say is that these indicators and statistics, although helpful and useful and help us target resource, do not define us as communities. What we do and what we strive to achieve to do, that's what makes the community and creates the, the opportunity to change it for the better. That is why I welcome the Scottish Government's Fair Scotland Action Plan. It is the Government's first response to the Fair Scotland co uh, conversation and backs their ambitions for a fair, smart, inclusive Scotland that will offer equality of opportunity for everyone. I believe that equality of opportunity is a good starting point for us all within this chamber. But government alone cannot achieve this. It needs to be all of us, nationally, locally, and regardless of political stance. Communities need to embrace this, presiding officer. As I've mentioned earlier, poverty is not inevitable, regardless of who you are and where you live. But there are still too many of our people being left behind 
and it is our job to ensure that they receive the support they require and not be lost to us. We need to tackle what is known as the poverty premium, the fact that many lower income households often pay higher prices for basic necessities like gas, electricity and banking. Finding a bank or a post office in a local street now is becoming more and more difficult. And it's the individuals that we're talking about who are the people who actually need to actually get a, a bank or a bond society in their street. But a study by Citizens Advice Scotland found that utility companies are breeding poverty by charging poorer people more for their services. More than a quarter, 27 per cent of poor people use costly prepayment energy meters, often costing over £100 per month. In comparison, only 12 per cent of middle earners and 1 per cent of high earners use these meters. 47 per cent of people on low incomes use more expensive pay-as-you-go mobile phones, compared to 31 per cent of middle income earners and 9 per cent of high income earners. While the Scottish Government is committed to tackling the poverty premium, many of the powers to fully address this are still held by the UK Government, such as the cost of utilities, including energy and telecoms. So once again, we are left in the need for further powers. This Parliament needs to address these issues fully. But even with that added challenge, as always, this Scottish Government is trying to find ways to address this. They are already protecting our communities by ensuring that £100 million is spent mitigating against the worst excesses of the Tory Westminster Government. But although that is helpful, every pound spent in mitigation measures ensures that we obviously have a pound less to spend in boosting the economy, encouraging jobs, job creation and, most importantly, presiding officer, getting people out of poverty. The Scottish Government is doing all it can to reduce the poverty pre premium. Some of the actions set out in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. One of their goals is to work towards Scotland being a good food nation, where people have access to affordable, healthy, nutritious food in a dignified way. A recent event attended, I attended with the Scottish Poverty Alliance. There was much concern about how we could actually ensure that our populace did not get themselves into an uncontrollable spiral of debt. So the Scottish Government's financial health check service for people with low incomes is welcome, helping those uh, on low incomes the, the most, they make the most of their money to secure the best energy tariffs and offer uh, access to bank accounts. It's also important that the Scottish Government is working with partners to ensure that Scotland's people get the advice that they need at the time that they need it. The Scottish Government wants to change deep-seated, multi-generational de de deprivation, poverty and inequalities. Is this challenging? Yes. Is this ambition? Yes. It is also a long-term goal that we all must buy into, but it is the right thing to do. Let me take you back to the beginning of my speech and talk about areas like Seat Hill and Fergusley and Paisley. These problems are deep-seated and have been like that for generations. We must use this opportunity to draw a line in the sand and say no more. It is not acceptable for us to have people in the same street as us who are living in poverty, unable to access the support they need or get the opportunity to achieve their own dreams and aspirations. Presiding officer, we all come into this world the same way, and no matter who we are or where we live, we're all heading towards the same inevitable end. Let's work together to make sure that the bit in the middle, life itself, can be an opportunity for all Scots to achieve all their dreams and aspirations. Annie Wells to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Reading through the Scottish Government's extensive dossier, I think we can all agree that behind the buzzwords and bluster, there is a genuine desire to tackle poverty, inequality and social deprivation in Scotland. No one questions this, but I do question is the, que the Scottish Government's focus on the commitment to the task. How on earth can the Scottish Government fix the problems it routinely highlights when it so routinely points the finger at the UK Government and distracts us all from the new welfare and employment service powers it now holds? Repeatedly quoting that Scotland is only getting 15 per cent of the benefit budget is absolute nonsense when the Scottish Government has the ability to top up any reserve benefit it sees fit. How can the Scottish Government instigate any kind of economic growth, inclusive or not, in the midst of the uncertainty it has created over the draft referendum bill? It seems ra rather odd that the Minister would note in her foreword the uncertainty caused by Scotland coming out of the EU as a barrier to economic growth, but not Scotland leaving the UK, a union that is worth four times as much to Scotland's export market and three times as much to Scotland's public finances as our membership of the EU. 
Of course, I want to see a fairer Scotland. I represent Glasgow, one of the most deprived parts of Scotland. But let's get real about it and what it generally going on, the benefits of people of Scotland. Let's look at the areas that create greater equality of opportunity, as laid out by the Scottish Government. That is early years and childcare policy, education, health, affordable housing, and improving wages and working conditions. Has the Scottish Government excelled in any of these areas so far? No. It has changed its mind at least at the last minute with regards to childcare, finally listening to our calls for a flexible system, allowing parents to choose their own childminders and nurseries. A welcome policy change, but one that took far too long. It should also mimic another of our policies if it truly wants to tackle poverty at the childhood level. And that is to extend childcare provision to a higher percentage of two-year-olds, which under its current plan will only cover just 27 per cent, as well as introduce a number of disadvantaged one-year-olds. In education, the, SSP, the SNP has failed to decrease the attainment gap and raise standards in schools. The SSLN report released this year gave a shocking assessment on failing numeracy standards with a proportion of primary four pupils meeting most of the expected standards in maths, falling by 10 per cent between 2011 and 2015. Scotland's most disadvantaged children are now four times less likely to go to university than those from wealthy areas, a figure nearly double that of England. And at college level, we have seen the number of college places slashed by over 152,000 since 2007. In health, which the SNP has overseen since 2007, there has actually been reduction in NHS funding by 1% in real terms, despite an increase in England by 6% between 2010-11 and 2014-15. Let's look at affordable housing also. Although housing has been devolved since 1999, the SNP has held office since 2007, and the SNP-led government has failed to meet its own original 2011 manifesto target of building more than 6,000 new socially rented houses a year. By 2015-16, this figure had dropped to less than 3,500 in the year. Housing conditions are not up to standard, with around 74,000 households in Scotland suffering from overcrowding, and 11 per cent are affected by dampness or condensation. Yeah? Alex Rowley. Thank you, Annie Wells, for giving way. Can I ask, does the Scottish Tory party accept any responsibility whatsoever for the failed uh, austerity policy that you have been supporting for the last six years? Annie Wells. I think what, what we'll find is that we're looking now at the welfare powers and employment powers that are coming to the Scottish Government. And we, as a party, have had to manage what the, Scottish, what the Labour government and uh, Westminster left us to deal with. So, uh, but at the moment, we're talking about the welfare powers that are coming to Scotland. There's 35 per cent of households that are currently living in full poverty. And finally, on to job creation. As a Joseph Rowntree report on poverty highlighted, and as my colleague Adam Tompkins pointed out, the best route out of poverty is work. And when it comes to job creation, Scotland is currently the worst performing part of the UK. In fact, it's 8.5% behind the rest of the UK. And for young women aged between 18 to 24, the number of those working has fallen by over 4%, while across the UK it has increased by nearly 3%. When we talk about fairness and wages, I want to ask the Scottish Government why it is that the gender pay gap here in Scotland is the highest of the whole of the UK at nearly £11,000, compared to the UK average of just under 9000 And we can sit here today Blame the UK Government for all of Scotland's woes and paint a new utopian future in an SNP-led Scotland. But let's be frank, the SNP's record in government is less than great when it comes to tackling poverty, inequality and social deprivation. Education, health, housing and the economy fall short of the standards we should expect, while the SNP becomes distracted once again by independence. Scottish people don't want to see 100 pages of spin, bluster and empty promises. The Scottish people want to see a Scottish Government that can deliver. Jenny Gorruth to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Wisdom, justice, compassion, integrity. The four founding principles of this parliament, a thread of fairness interlinking each. But Scotland isn't always a fair country. A couple of weeks ago, my head of office was arranging a meeting on my behalf with a local business. On hearing my name, the site manager remarked to her, oh, it's a she. Does she know she'll have to wear safety boots and a high-vis jacket? Sexism, alive and well in 2016. Presiding officer, fairness was important to me as a child because I am the eldest of three girls. Everything had to be fair in our house, or at least seemed to be if you ask my sisters. At school, I was taught and indeed I went on to teach myself about fairness in modern studies, about inequality, about injustice, about how societal structures don't always allow people to get on. Those from ethnic minority communities, those with disabilities, those from the poorest households, women. I remember a newspaper article handed out in our class. It was about a group of Conservative MPs in the late 1990s, just after Blair and his so-called babes had swept to power. And even despite the historical increase in female representation under Labour, at the time, only 18% of all MPs were women. The article spoke of the behaviour of some of the Conservative MPs. When the newly elected Labour women rose to speak, they would hiss, they would make noises, they would use their hands to pretend they had female body parts. Presiding officer, I can see it now as clear as day. The boys in my class were in hysterics. None of the girls laughed. The first point in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan commits the government, councils and public bodies to a socio-economic duty. This will require public bodies to assess the impact of policy and service changes on tackling poverty. It will make our councils more accountable. And we need local authorities to be fully cognisant about just how crucial fairness is. It cuts across the government's agenda in education, for example. Presiding officer, if you look across the water to Fife, you'll find 19 secondary schools with three women as head teachers in a secondary population which is 60% female. My own school in St Andrews has never had a female head teacher. This is 2016. I'm therefore delighted that the government will look to make the most of the connection between this duty and those on equality and human rights and will place a similar duty on education authorities to deliver. The action plan further commits the government to a new mental health strategy to be published later this year and to an investment of £150 million over the next five years. Now I know the Minister's appointment has been broadly welcomed and that it evidences a serious commitment to mental health provision. In their response to the mental health strategy consultation, Sam H called for the standard for headship uh, for new head teachers to include a specific commitment to a whole school approach to improve, improving health and wellbeing. And I would very much support Sam H in this request. Indeed, presiding officer, you will know that I have previously raised mental health education in this chamber as a members debate. And we know that poor mental health is linked to deprivation. Figures published by ISD Scotland last year showed that those from Scotland's poorest areas are more than three times as likely to be treated for mental health illness than their richer counterparts. The government must therefore make sure that the dots are joined when it comes to mental health education. The mental health strategy is vital to the fairness agenda, but I believe it would be totally remiss if it fails to mention curriculum content. Now I know that the cabinet secretary will be familiar with the big green curriculum for excellence folder. Can I therefore strongly encourage her to seek assurances from the new Minister for Mental Health that the strategy works to join curriculum content in the health and wellbeing curriculum area to the new national mental health strategy. Number 25 in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan is the introduction of a bill to establish domestic abuse as a specific offence. The bill is part of the Equally Safe Strategy which will be brought forward by the end of this year. Presiding officer, I recently met with Fife Women's Aid in my constituency. They work tirelessly to support women and families who suffer from the direct effects of domestic abuse. Their Children and Young People Service runs a school holiday programme. Their befriending service matches up service users to volunteers, giving them support at doctor's appointments, for example. They also provide an in-house independent advocacy service. And yet, 129 women and 120 children have accessed refuge in Fife over the past 12 months alone. In the same period, Fife Women's Aid received 374 requests for refuge. Despite the vital service delivered by Fife Women's Aid, they now find themselves in the unenviable position of having to compete with other organisations for funding. This is because Fife Council have established a homeless sector public social partnership. The manager and one of the trustees shared their serious concerns with me that they will now be at risk of missing out on crucial funding. 
So can I implore the Cabinet Secretary today to look at how the Government can work with local authorities to guarantee funding for women's aid organisations. The establishment of an advisory council on women and girls will allow the Government to tackle workplace inequality. The council will celebrate the advances that have already been made, such as the positive progress around women's representation in public life. Look at this Parliament. Look at our First Minister. Look at my predecessor in this place who sat in your seat, formerly presiding officer. There are reasons to be cheerful for Scotland's girls. In education, we aspire to get it right for every child. The government's fairness agenda is the next step on that journey, to rectify inequality in our local communities, to empower individuals to be part of that change, to ensure all local authorities are democratic, accountable and fair to all of the people that they serve. Thank you. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you. If this Parliament is to achieve anything in the five-year term, it must make progress in challenging poverty and inequality. And I suggest it must be the kind of change that is generational. The appointment of Naomi Eisenstadt uh, has to be commended, I believe, by the Scottish Government, and in my opinion was a game-changer because she continues to point out the important relationship between poverty and inequality. In a roundtable discussion that I chaired last week, she emphasised this point where she said that poverty and inequality are not necessarily the same thing, and that we need to be careful in reducing one doesn't have a negative effect on someone else. She talked about capital inequality being the biggest inequality, and that certainly drove home to me. The obvious example of that is that parents uh, or people who own property and pass it on to their children gives their children the ability to take higher risks in life, whether it's going into business or knowing that at some point in their life that they will inherit something uh, that many people do not. For example, if your parents re uh, uh, rent their, ho their, their homes in the rented sector. She also talks about the no wrong door principle. And I haven't read through all of the document, I, I confess. Uh, but I'd like to think that that principle is contained within the document because I think she's right about this. That wherever the system uh, applies itself, that when you're trying to change your career or do better in your life, there should be no door which you knock, which should be the wrong one. And I think that's the kind of system that we should try to create. So, of course, like everyone else, I welcome the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. There are obvious omissions which have been addressed by Adam Tompkins and others about the black minority ethnic community in particular. I do think, uh, and I'm pleased that the government have accepted the Labour Amendment, because I do think as we progress this, there needs to be more specific and ambitious action, particularly on job progression. And I'd like to see at some stage some reference to an exit plan for food banks. But I want to address in my remarks this afternoon uh, a section of the report on young people and decent work. Because again, Naomi Eisenstadt talks about the age group 16 to 24. Now, I accept that Annie Wells is right about the importance of early years, but what she says, this age group merits more attention than it's currently getting, because it's that stage in your life that you're beginning to, be, to become an adult and make decisions in your life. So recommendation 38 is the one that I read through in more depth than anything else, where it talks about an equal chance in life, and rightly so. A few issues that I would like to throw into the debate. The first is uh, on the question of private tuition in schools, and I've been asking the Education Minister some questions about this. Um, the Sutton Trust, in a report released last month, has called it the hidden secret of British education. Now, admittedly, there isn't a great deal of reference to Scotland, although there is some. But given pupils who receive private tuitions are more likely to come from better off families, we need to ensure that private tuition does not make inequality worse. Uh, there are some facts here that privately educated students are twice as likely to receive private tuition as state educated pupils. Uh, and according to estimates, poorer students, as you would uh, expect, are likely to receive, are less likely to receive private tuition. And the point in this, if you believe it's important, we're all sitting the same exams. And because of the concentration on closing the attainment gap, I think it's something the government do need to address. And I'd like to commend many schools across Scotland, two in particular, Castlemilk High School and John Paul Academy, who've really put quite a bit of resource into out of school on weekend schools to provide that additional support that children need to get through their exams and provide that level of equality. 
But obviously, I think uh, it's accepted that the focus of what young people should do in their lives should be broader than university and accepting, of course, we need to do more to get people from poorer backgrounds into university. The gender gap has been talked about this afternoon. Uh, apprenticeships, I think, are an important aspect of the strategy, um, but they should not increase or reinforce inequalities. Um, some evidence suggests that that gap is already increasing and the negative elements of the system continue to be set in motion as the Scottish Modern Apprenticeships, the flagship training programme for school leavers, relying on public funds, sets the beginning of occupational segregation with young people focused on, on traditional gender roles. This can only move towards a long-term effect in the workforce if we don't start to turn this around. And engineering being the perfect example, there are just so few women in engineering, it's really quite shocking. Men in Scotland can expect a percentage wage increase of over 20% on a modern apprenticeship qualification, but women in Scotland can expect less than half. I also wanted to talk about recommendation, recommendation 37, which is the industry experience. Um, I think this is a very important concept, one which I wholeheartedly support. I think a thousand in industry placements across Scotland is quite, is quite woeful, actually. Uh, and I would like to see the government return uh, in the annual progress report to, um, to give us a report on that. In my closing 30 seconds, I just wanted to mention the issue of young people between 16 and 25, and I think fairness in the travel arrangements. So we know that uh, if you're an apprentice, you earn £3.40. If you're under 18, you earn £4 as a national minimum wage. But yet, 16-year-olds pay their full adult fare in public transport. Many of them are still at school. Hardly any of them will be working. I really think this is an area that the government needs to look at because giving young people that level of independence to get out of the house, whether it's to go to school or to go to college or meet their friends, has a big impact on their lives. I'd like to see the government address that particular point for 16 and 24 year olds. Thank you, presiding officer. Tom Arthur, followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to begin by commending the government on tabling this debate and welcome the publication of the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. The scope of this document is impressive, reflecting the breadth and depth of the views of the thousands of people who participated in the Fairer Scotland conversation. The wide-ranging nature of the Action Plan also reflects the scale of the government's ambition and also the nature of the challenges we face in building a Fairer Scotland. In the ministerial foreword, the Cabinet Secretary states that we don't expect to fix things within the five years of a parliamentary term. We're not looking for quick wins, but genuine cultural change and societal change. I believe this to be absolutely the correct approach. No nation can affect the transformational change that we aspire to in the course of one parliamentary session. If we are to succeed, and we must, it is going to take all of us in this place and beyond to work constructively in a manner worthy of the objective of creating a fairer Scotland. Presiding officer, I think that each of us in this chamber could have prepared remarks on how any one of the proposed 50 fairness actions for the parliamentary term would benefit each and every one of our own constituents. One only need to refer to a few of those measures to get a sense of the work um, proposed and indeed already underway, be it the delivering of 50,000 warm and affordable homes the Scottish Baby Box, a bill to establish domestic abuse as a specific offence, delivery of 100% superfast broadband access by 2021. There's going to be support for disabled people to stand in next year's council elections through the Access to Elected Office Fund and a huge expansion in early learning and childcare entitlement. The review and reform of gender recognition law for people who identify as transgender or intersex builds an equal marriage and making Scotland one of the best places in the world to live if you're LGBTI. The full implementation of the recommendations from the Commission on Widening Access is one of the many steps being taken to ensure equity in education and new support to help older people claim the financial support they're entitled to is to be welcomed. Along with the other measures outlined in this action plan, the programme demonstrates that this government is getting on with the job of building a fairer Scotland. My only regret is that rather than having the powers in this parliament to go further, we have to divert resources to mitigate the effects of UK government cuts. And we must now also contend with the uncertainty and disruption inflicted upon us from the Brexit debacle. However, it is right and proper that this Scottish government does all that it practically can 
within the existing constitutional arrangements. Further, in setting out a vision of a fairer Scotland, it has begun the process of establishing the values that will inform the use of current and any future powers held by this Parliament. And it is on that fundamental subject of values to which I would li now like to turn to. And in doing so, I'd like to consider the values underpinning the, no the new social security powers, because I think nothing shows the measure of society and how it treats its most vulnerable. In a new future for so social security in Scotland, published shortly before the last election, the then Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil wrote that the principles set out in that document would apply equally to a future where the Scottish Parliament has full control over social security. Two of the principles in particular I regard as particularly significant in the setting of values, that social security is an investment in the people of Scotland and respect for the dignity of individuals is at the heart of everything we do. I raise these two principles in particular because I believe that they capture an important aspect of what we mean when we speak of a fairer Scotland. But in articulating our vision of a fairer Scotland, it is also important to state what is not part of that vision. For too long, we have been subjected to an agenda from a UK government that has sought to stigmatise and frankly dehumanise those who have needed support. Be it the bedroom tax or the assessment regimes which claimants have been subjected to, the message from the UK government being, has been is that if you need help, you are a burden. Egregious as those measures are, the proposal to limit tax credits to the first two children, along with the rape clause, demonstrate that the UK government's conception of fairness is not one which would be recognised by any civilised or progressive person. The big society has been abandoned in favour of a return to the view that there is no such thing as society. The bleak and draconian approach of the UK government underscores the need for our Scottish government and this parliament to continue to take a radically different approach. We have the opportunity to define what sort of society we seek for this and future generations. The term fairness has been in public discourse often used interchangeably with other familiar terms such as social justice, equality, equality of opportunity and equity. For me, all of these terms capture different nuances and aspects of an ancient and universal concept. That whatever the variance in our attributes and genetic predispositions, we are all endowed with a sense of dignity and a need to be valued and to belong. When we recognize and embody this principle, it serves as a check on that all too prevalent propensity for politicians and decision makers to regard problems in abstract and technocratic terms where human beings are reduced to inputs and an economic calculation. Martin Luther King perhaps put it best when he spoke of the need to move from being a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Systems and processes are, of course, vital, but values are fundamental. It takes more than a veil of ignorance to prevent a veil of tears. As we set out to create a fairer Scotland, let us build it together upon a foundation that recognises our shared humanity that we all deserve to be treated with dignity and that through mutual support and solidarity, we will all benefit and prosper. Graham Simpson to be followed by Ben McPherson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, government officers throughout the world are stuffed with weighty reports outlining strategies for this or that. We have another one now, the 100 page epic fairer Scotland action plan. It might have been fairer on all of us just to call it the SNP failures on poverty dossier. This is a party that's been in government for nearly 10 years but doesn't want to accept that anything that's wrong, anything that's not been fixed is their fault. With their constant obsession with independence, they've dragged Scotland down, held us back, held us back, and let down, let down, Mr. Stevenson, the very people that this report suggests will now have to wait until 2030 before their lives are anything approaching fair. Debates like this remind me why I'm in politics. Politicians have been debating fairness and equality for all my life and long before, and I'm much older than I'd like to be. And here we are again today after decades and decades of failure from parties in Scotland who've just taken the votes of the poor for granted. First, Labour and now the SNP. Um, Alex Rowley 
was quite wrong to suggest that poverty only began in 2010. So what is fairness? Some argue that only by achieving equality can we achieve fairness. But that's both simplistic and wrong. We could all be more equal, but be worse off on average. What we should be trying to achieve is not a more equal society, but a society where the lives of those who are worst off is constantly improving. I want to focus on two areas ably uh, covered by Annie Wells, housing and education. Why do we still have sink estates in our major cities? Why in a so-called progressive country do we put up with this? On housing, there's been a wholesale failure to kickstart house building and make it a national infrastructure priority. That represents a massive social and economic cost. House building is down 40% since the SNP came to power in 2007. Private sector house building is down 44% and public sector down by 18%. The SNP are failing on housing conditions. Around 74,000 households in Scotland suffer from overcrowding and 11% are affected by dampness or condensation. Compliance with the Scottish Housing Quality Standard remains poor. 45% fail to achieve the standard. 30% fail to hit the energy efficiency criterion. These are shaming statistics. And yet, according to Shelter Scotland, there are 27,000 empty homes in Scotland. What a waste. The SNP are letting Scotland down on fuel poverty. 35% of households are currently in fuel poverty, up from the 2007 level of 25%. And that compares to 15% of households across the UK as a whole. 9.5% of households are currently in extreme fuel poverty conditions. The SNP are failing Scotland on energy efficiency and have cut the fuel poverty energy efficiency budget by 13.2%. However, I do welcome a commitment to tackle the fuel poverty premium. That was uh, mentioned by George Adam. It remains the case there is only one energy company offering gas and electricity to consumers with no standing charge. Quite incredible, really. And it cannot be right. On education, there's been a failure to decrease the attainment gap and raise standards in schools. This risks a lost generation. Standards in schools are declining, as Annie Wells said. From 2007 to 2015, the percentage of primary four pupils performing well or very well in numeracy drops from 77% to 66%, and the percentage of primary seven pupils performing well or very well in numeracy fell from 72 to 66%. And Scotland's poorest children are missing out on university. Students from the most advantaged areas are four times more likely to go to university than those from the least advantaged areas. That compares to three times for Wales and Northern Ireland and 2.4 times for England. The SNP have slashed the number of college places by over 152,000 since 2007. I'll make one final point, and it's this. If we want to do any of the things necessary to help the disadvantaged, we need a successful economy. You don't do that by making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK, and you don't do it by continuing to hold the threat of another independence referendum over the heads, over the heads of ordinary citizens and the very businesses who could create the wealth we need. Presiding officer, if we want fairness, we have to start by admitting the failures, blaming others simply will not do. Uh, can, I, can I say to everyone, we do have a wee bit of time in hand. It's very typical when we don't have time in hand, all your speeches run over. And today everyone's been very, very punctilious. So there is a little time in hand if you want to um, intervene rather than shout at each other. 
uh, from your respective seats. Uh, so I now call Ben McPherson to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I warmly welcome the action plan from the Scottish Government with a broad agenda to change the law, to allocate and distribute resources, and to shift consciousness, social attitudes, and affect social change in order to build a fairer Scotland. It is an action plan with bold proposals across a range in terms of creating a fair Scotland for all, ending child poverty, a strong start for young people, fairer working lives, and other aspects of our society and our economy. 50 actions to give meaning to sometimes nebulous words like fairness, phrases like social justice, terms and values like equality, things that we should all aim for as a democracy and as a society, but if we want to deliver those values and aims, we need to have firm plans and actions, and that is exactly what this action plan does. Around all the different areas, from democracy and participation to equality of opportunity, from rights and protection to equal recognition and appreciation for what individuals do in our society and our economy. And I'll come back to that later if I have time. And also support and provision for those in need, using the new powers coming to this parliament around social security to create a system that is better based in dignity and respect in order to be able to support those in need in times of need. Now, What's been apparent through most of the discussion in this debate so far is that there's a sense of unified purpose, that a, shared, a fairer Scotland is something that's desired. And also there has been a welcoming of the 50 recommendations. Some would like to see more recommendations, some would like to see things go further. And even on the opposition benches in the Conservative Party, there hasn't been criticism of an individual aspect of the 50-point plan. What has been disappointing is a, a kind of staggering lack of context around the position that Scotland is in right now from the, the social and economic change and the, the policies of those who've managed the, the, in the majority of those decades the, the Scottish economy. But um, I don't want to, to blame others either. I want to focus on the, the 50 excellent proposals within this plan and also I want to recognize the spirit of the plan the, the debate today is not only just about the content of that action plan but also around the spirit that it takes all of us business industry public sector third sector and people individually and collectively and I would just like to touch on some of the action points uh, and how they relate to that spirit but also how they relate to my constituency and the wider messages that can be gained from that. Action number five talks about tackling the poverty premium and making affordable credit more easily available uh, and using areas across government to create greater financial inclusion in 2017. And on that, I would really like to highlight the Castle Community Bank as an example of community and business using initiative and working together to have a positive impact on the common good and on areas around financial inclusion. The Community Bank is a merger of credit unions aiming to give a financial community, aiming to give financial accessibility to everyone. It is a social enterprise and it's been created by someone who Reverend Ian May, who used to work in the commercial banking sector, using his expertise to create a community bank to enhance the availability of credit unions. That is a perfect example of how this action plan relates to real impacts on the ground and people who are taking initiative on the ground. And the Castle Community Bank is a fantastic example of that. And I will write to the, the Cabinet Secretary to, to give her more detail on that in, in the coming days. There's another commitment, number seven, around targeting 1% of council budgets to participatory budgeting. Right now, in its seventh year in Leith, Leith decides is happening. There are people in my constituency who are voting on the merits of community projects, allowing community interaction in order to decide where public funds are allocated. That is an example of how this action plan is relevant and Leith decides is a perfect example of how greater indeed. Alex Rowley. Thank Ben McPherson for giving me in. I agree that we need to see much more impairment and, and community budgeting is, is one part of that. But 1% is, 
that 1% of council budgets is going down and down and down. Does he not agree that we need to try and work together in here to stop the cuts to local community services and public services? Ben McPherson. Within the plan, there is a, a commitment from the, the Scottish Government around the local taxation and the manifesto commitment that there was to increase the banding the taxation of those who are in the top bands of the council tax arrangement and that will that will gather extra extra funding for for local government and and and, and the three percent variation as part of the SNP manifesto will create greater funds for local government and of course the from the higher banding there will be more available funds for education the moving on from from leaf to sides and, and participatory budgeting the commitment to make Scotland a good food nation in, in terms of trying to create opportunities for communities to have uh, access to affordable, healthy, nutritious food in a dignified way. I welcome the, the Fair Food Fund and indeed this is making a difference in my constituency. There has already been investment from the Scottish Government in projects like Crops and Pots. Uh, who do great work on leaf links, granting community gardeners who are taking bits of unused local authority land and creating great community gardens in which local communities come together and, and not only share food at the end of that process, but also um, share a sense of, of, of community and, 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 and beyond that. And uh, that's an example of how actions, clear actions from this plan are making a difference right now and they can continue to make a difference as we take this plan forward. Lastly, because I'm, I'm aware of time, commitment number 42 around the living wage. If we, of course, don't have control over the minimum wage of Scot in Scotland, but next week, Living Wage Week, is another opportunity for us all in the spirit of, of, of commitment number, action number 42 in the plan to help raise awareness of the living wage and encourage as many uh, employers within our, our communities to, to pay the living wage because that greater payment for all Recognising the commitment of all to the economy is something that will be of mutual benefit and I'm, I'm delighted to, to see the government supporting that enthusiastically in this plan. Thank you. Elaine Smith to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Scottish Government debate today because there can be no doubt that inequality, poverty and deprivation are the causes of many problems in our communities and tackling these issues is the most important thing, in my opinion, that we can do as parliamentarians. In particular, child poverty in a country as well off as Scotland is simply shocking. Many children living in poverty are in households where at least one parent is working. Many of these families are suffering fuel poverty and relying on food banks, and many don't even have a house. 5,000 children in Scotland woke up this morning without a home of their own, which affects their mental health, their well-being and their attainment. The Labour Party and Government recognised the importance of ending child poverty by setting targets, which were later scrapped by the Tories. And I note that the Scottish Government wants to carry uh, the legacy of those targets on in a more ambitious way, as they put it. And of course, any and all attempts to alleviate child poverty should be given support, and members on these benches will no doubt support that aim. But I do feel that more clarity on the detail as soon as possible would be welcome. Overall, the Government's Affairs Scotland Action Plan is a recognition of the problems our society faces, having consulted and listened to people and communities, and is an attempt to provide solutions. So, on a positive note at the start, can I commend the Government for this work, but I will come back shortly to the bigger picture. First, though, I have some specific questions and comments on some of the action points. Under Action Point 12, there is a reference to an accessible travel framework to help disabled travellers enjoy the same rights as everyone else. With regards to rail travel, I hope then that the Government will fully consider the need for a safety trained guard on all of our trains to help to meet this particular aim. Action Point 17 commits the Government to make social security fairer where we can. What I would like to know from the Government is, will this involve using the newly devolved ability to top up and create new benefits through the Scotland Bill? And in summing up, perhaps uh, the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister can explain in more detail the way in which universal credit will be made fairer. 
Action point 23 is a commitment to concentrate over the next 12 months on promoting, sustaining and protecting breastfeeding. And that's very welcome, particularly since uh, in more deprived areas the rates are lower. But again, I think that some more detail on this would be most welcome. You know, it always strikes me as astonishing that our society seems to accept formula as the norm instead of mother's milk. And it's an amazing feat of big business to boost their profits by selling women a product that's inferior in so many ways to the one that they actually have freely available. So I think the Scottish Government needs to find ways to get the message out, particularly to young women in deprived areas, that their milk is a designer food for their baby and that no substitute can convey the many health and nutritional benefits that they themselves can give their child. I think breastfeeding as the norm would be a massive boost to future health and wellbeing. So overall, whilst I do uh, appreciate the, the good intentions of the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, I feel that the actual action proposed is a bit thin on the ground and that there are many promises of further publications and legislation. Where there is specific funding promise, it's welcome, for example, the increase in carers allowance, but the ambitions outlined in the plan are unlikely to be met by such promises alone, which is why we need annual progress reports, and I'm pleased that uh, the government has indicated that they will support uh, Labour's Labour's uh, amendment on this. The new socio-economic duty on public bodies to take into account poverty and disadvantage when key decisions are being made is very welcome. In fact, there's an argument that every single policy should be poverty-proofed. However, uh, implementing policies takes funding, and so we need to consider where it comes from. In local government, a decade of council tax freeze has left councils struggling to deliver the services that many would want to deliver to tackle poverty. And of course, the plan to increase the higher council tax bans is welcome, but it's only a small tweak and it's not the complete overhaul uh, needed. It's not being bold on local tax reform. And I would suggest that without a revaluation, change is not going to be viewed as fair to all. And further, uh, on the point that Ben McPherson made, whilst it's difficult to argue against increased funding for attainment, councils do have a legitimate concern about the centralisation of local decision making. Presiding officer, from the government's consultation, it seems that our communities want a fairer, more equal Scotland, and the minister is very keen to point out that it takes all of us to build that fairer Scotland. But like Alison Johnson, it then seems to me to achieve these goals, this government will need to utilise our new tax powers. Of course, one barrier to this is the impression in society that tax is somehow a bad thing. The reality is that progressive taxation is a good thing. It's our collective taxes that pay for a civilised society, caring for the elderly, educating children, providing free health service for all, ensuring the rule of law and justice, funding the armed forces, protecting the environment, etc. And the kind of society we would have if all of this was left up to individuals instead of governments doesn't really bear thinking about. Interestingly, though, when I was considering what I wanted to say today, I thought that most people make charity donations, including donations to food banks. They pay their dues to clubs, etc. And many happily contribute to local churches, specifically to help the poor. So why is it that tax is seen as some kind of affliction to be suffered rather than paying your dues to society? Well, undoubtedly because governments have either encouraged that kind of thinking, refused to ask the rich to pay a fair share for a better society, or simply failed to present tax in a good light. Now, such approaches to taxation might be expected from the Tories, but they are more surprising from this government, who like to present themselves as centre-left. In closing, I want to say, presiding officer, that I actually believe there is a responsibility on a good government to make people think about what their taxes are actually for, to present progressive taxation in a positive way, and to help to change attitudes to paying tax. The SNP used to take this approach uh, in opposition with, for example, their penny for Scotland. And I do think that a target of 2030 to implement this Fairer Scotland plan in full is not very ambitious for a government a decade into office. To have a fair and more equal society, we really need redistribution and we need to use our tax powers, which would accelerate the ability to seriously tackle poverty once and for all. If this government is serious about making different choices to Tory austerity, then they should get on with using those powers that we have to do that. It's a political choice. So no more excuses. We've had the conversation. We have the powers, and now we need to, to take the action. Thank you. Christina McKelvey, followed by Alison Harris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We've spoken a lot this afternoon about fairness, and to be fair, fairness is an idea that's challenging to pin down. But we all know roughly what it means. 
when we use the word in everyday context, yet it can mean everything or nothing. For most of us, our first idea of fairness was in the school playground, as we heard Jenny Go Ruth speaking about in her remarks, or at home with our brothers and sisters. Nothing was ever fair in my house, I have to say. A childish, naive idea of fairness, yet absolutely at the nub of it, because fairness does not discriminate between people on the basis of their gender, their religion, their age, their ability or disability, their race or their social background. It's not the same as treating everyone exactly the same. We know that. So what does fairness mean in the governance and makeup of social policy? How can we ensure that we, what, we, what we plan for Scotland and our new social security bill and our poverty bill and all of the other pieces of legislation that flow through this place, how can we ensure that it's fair? Well, we can learn from current situations that we already live in. Presiding officer, last week I had the opportunity to see Ken Loach's new film, I, Daniel Blake. I watched it last week with my son and it devastated both of us. It devastated the entire cinema and as I believe is devastating audiences across the whole of the UK. It's harsh, it's brutal, it's cruel. The unfairness of the UK benefit system is all too familiar to me and to many of my constituents, the Daniel and Danielle Blakes who come through my door. We see it every day, the real meaning of social deprivation. And Loach isn't trying to put out some objective documentary, no. The film is based on interviews with real people in real situations, then portrayed in the demeaning, unhelpful, and yes, unfair treatment of a middle-aged widower who has just had a near fatal heart attack. His doctor tells him to rest. He's not fit for work. The job centre tells him to find a job. Now, that's what I call unfair. In that film, Daniel Blake asked to just be recognised as a citizen, nothing more and nothing less. And if we filter every piece of legislation we do through this parliament, through a human rights prism, then we should be treating every citizen as nothing more and nothing less. That's what I call fairness. And a lot, if not everyone, of us in this chamber will have seen the impact of Westminster austerity upon the lives of people in our communities and our families. I don't have to think for too long. There's a lady who suffers from extreme agoraphobia who hasn't been able to get out of a 10th floor flat for a year now. The job centre has told her she's physically perfectly fit to work and to find a job. There is an elderly gentleman who has a whole case file with a series of difficult medical problems. He's been told he's fit for work. There's a single mother with two young children, one of whom is very disabled and needs a lot of complex medical kit at home. Because she used a small extra bedroom to keep it in, she was hit by the bedroom tax, thankfully mitigated by this government and hopefully abolished very, very soon. But, presiding officer, it's not all misery, doom and gloom. Scotland's own government, this government, is moving to a position where it will have the power to change really change the punitive and outdated welfare system that puts in its place something innovative and effective, an action plan for a fairer Scotland. And we've heard a lot about that, and we hear a lot about action plans and what they should do. But we get an opportunity in this place to work together to achieve that fairer Scotland in that action plan. And it really is about action, as we've heard. Alison um, Johnson mentioned earlier, it's great having an action plan, but it has to actually take some action. And I'm proud to see that there's 50 concrete actions set out in the consultation and some 15 or so stakeholder groups and organisations involved in that. These targets are ambitious and they will have a real impact. Yeah. Graeme Simpson. Christine McKelvey. Um, Christine McKelvey has uh, uh, complained a lot in this chamber and again today uh, about things she doesn't like in the benefit system. She's uh, very good at highlighting cases. Uh, can she tell us... Um, specifically what she would do now that this uh, place is getting new powers, what would she do to change things? I'll be Kelby. absolutely delighted to move on to that in a few moments. As I said, it will take time to see the effect filter through, and I would wish to see that filter through, changing long-term assumptions and cutting through the, the tide of cynicism that has increased so dramatically with the Tory government at Westminster. It isn't going to be easy, I understand that. Now, moving on to some areas that I think an action that the government could take. 
There is three things that I'd like the Scottish Government to consider on the impact of poverty, and that is the impact of poverty on carers and some of the issues that have arisen with some of the carers I've spoken through the, the uh, consultation on social security. And I've raised these with the minister and she's taken those on board and hopefully we can move forward. We also need to change the rhetoric and the record of the Tory government on child poverty. We've heard so much about that today. These young people aren't shirkers. They're not spongers. They're young people who deserve the support and the nurturing from a government that cares about them and their future. That's one action that we could take. But if there is something that I would personally hope the Scottish Government addresses is the challenge faced by those diagnosed with motor neuron disease. I have long spoken about the effects of motor neuron disease in this chamber and not only in this chamber, this has been a lifelong campaign for me. So I would ask the Scottish Government to use that courage, the courage that the Cabinet Secretary spoke about in her open remarks, the courage I believe that she has, that when drafting the new Social Security Bill, that she thinks about fast-tracking motor neuron disease sufferers through that system give automatic entitlement to PIP and attendance allowance, and no, please, no continual reassessment. Imagine, if you will, diagnosed with motor neuron disease, told that your average life expectancy is 14 months, and you spend 10 of those months fighting a system to get a couple extra quid a week. We can change that, we can make a huge difference. You're talking about 340 people per year in Scotland. It's not a huge amount. So I think together, and working together, we can go with the campaign that MND Scotland has launched this, to this day, that let's get benefits right for people with MND. And if we can get it right for people with MND, we can get it right and start getting it right for other people who depend on social security. This government, this Scottish government, has not shirked its responsibilities. We know and understand why we need to get this right, and because we talk to the people on the front line, we know how they feel. The consultation on social security in Scotland closes this weekend, presiding officer, and is providing us with a vast amount of input from individuals trying to work in the system, as well as the larger charities and lobbying bodies who will want to see change. We can do that, presiding officer. We will do it, and with the support of our partners and our colleagues across this chamber and the commitment from everyone, we will see that fairer Scotland, not just for people with motor neuron disease, but for everyone who depends on the state to support them in times of extremity. Thank you. Um, it's good to have time in hand for the late speakers rather than the other way around. So uh, call Alison Harris, we're followed by James Dornan. Ms. Harris, I'll give you an extra couple of minutes That's if you fine. wish. Thank you. No, but they're yours for the taking. Do take Thank them. Thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this issue and the document entitled Fairer Scotland Action Plan. A document with such a worthwhile aim as everyone wants to see a reduction in poverty and the impact of poverty. There are many ways that this audible lane can be worked towards. Some are in this document whilst others are given none or very little emphasis. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a pity because whilst there is no silver bullet for achieving the reduction of poverty, there are some ways that can have a massive impact and I do hope the Government will take these on board. With the general acknowledgement that the most effective way out of poverty is by steady paid employment, there is much that the SNP can do, specifically by abandoning those policies that stifle businesses, economic growth and seek to increase taxes for working families. Promoting growth, boosting well-paid employment and reducing poverty is not done by making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK. It's not done by raising again the prospect of another divisive and destabilising referendum. It's not done by taking money out of the pockets of small business owners and families living in houses and bands E and F. And it's not done by failing to close the largest gender pay gap in the UK. And it's not done by failing to provide businesses and households with the rates... I'll just continue at the moment, please. Uh, not done by failing to provide businesses and households with the rates of superfast broadband enjoyed in other parts of the UK, with some areas a full 10% less than the UK average. Deputy Presiding Officer, at this point, can I say that it is a disgrace that some businesses in Grangemouth, the industrial hub of Scotland, are having to have their broadband beamed across the Forth from Clackmannan to give them anything like efficient speeds with which to grow their businesses. All these shortcomings and others of this SNP government are damaging businesses, stifling growth and costing jobs that would do so much to lift people out of poverty. I turn now to another way people can be helped out of poverty, education. What is the record of the SNP here? 
Well, for many families, having their child gain a place at college was the ideal start for their career choice. But wait, what has the government chosen to do? Cut the number of college places available to Scotland's youngsters by 152,000. Yes, 152,000 less chances for youngsters to get into further education. Today's statistics further emphasise the SNP's failures. Bursary support for students in Scotland has almost halved over the past five years to 66.1 million for 2015-16. So much for the strong start for all young people. They have failed in closing the attainment gap and failed in providing flexible childcare to allow parents back into work. As well as the obvious shortcomings, the document raises many questions. A National Poverty and Inequality Commission is to be established. But what's its role in remit? Well, to quote the document, details of what the Commission will do is still being firmed up. Well, that's hardly inspiring or giving confidence that the government has a clue about its purpose other than to provide a nice sounding title giving the impression of action. In the action plan, it mentions £29 million programme to tackle poverty, but it gives no criteria of how communities can access this money. I would have welcomed more details on plans to address the problems of poverty and ill health, both physical and mental, caused by the addictions of gambling, of drugs and of alcohol misuse. And we must not forget the effect that these addictions can have on the health of partners and children, as well as on relationships. Providing assistance to enable people to maintain jobs and a roof over their head while seeking treatment for addiction is another important aspect of stopping people from sinking into the poverty that is often the cause of addiction. Much more needs to be done to assist those who have served our country. Rates of homelessness and poverty amongst ex-servicemen and women are a case that needs special attention. However, in conclusion, there is much of value in the document. The contributions from individuals, businesses and the third sector have improved it greatly. However, in its next form, I do hope that the plan will recognise the shortcomings of the current one that myself and colleagues have highlighted today. Thank you. Um, I now call James Dorn to be the last speaker in the open debate. Then we move on to closing speeches. That's a fair warning. Mr Dorn, and you can have extra minutes if you wish, or speak more slowly if you can't. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As you know, I'm not a big fan of speaking too much, but I'll, 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 I'll do my best. Um, this Fair of Scotland conversation has been a perfect example of a government that wants to create a Fair of Scotland. Its priorities have been set by the people of Scotland themselves, but structured by the government and delivered in partnership by a range of professionals and dedicated people drawn from the public, private and third sectors. A conversation driven by the people and delivered by all sections of Scottish society. Over 17,500 people contributed through social media and many others attended public meetings from the borders to the islands of Scotland and demonstrated a willingness to, for government to be in a more inclusive way. And before I go on to speak to uh, some of the things that I'd like to mention later on, there's a couple of things I'd like to go back to. This morning, interestingly, I, I had a meeting, and during that meeting, it was highlighted to me that we already have a fair of Scotland and, and certain other parts of this island. We were talking about the refugee crisis, and we were talking about some of the things that are happening in the Mediterranean. Uh, and then Cali came up, uh, and we, we talked about some of the refugees that have been coming here uh, from Syria, mainly. And this person who works for a charity said that the difference between the way that the refugees have been welcomed in Scotland compared to other areas of the, these islands, let's say, has been stark. They've been, wel they've been welcomed with open arms. The organisations, the local authorities, the government, the people, the community have been overwhelming in the support for them. Unfortunately, not replicated all over that. I, I, um, heard the old story about college places again today and you know see if you're serious about trying to help people into work and if you're serious about making life better and making life fairer for people don't look for the college places by numbers look for them by quality we committed ourselves to the, the, that certain amount of hours we've kept that commitment and those jobs those, those, sorry those places are going to lead to jobs for many people and that would not have been the case with the college places before but some 
Yes, of course I will. Ali Brown. Thank you, James Dorn, for giving away. Does he accept, however, that we do have a skills shortage in a whole section of uh, 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 Scottish industry, um, and, and the building trades, and the care sector, and therefore we need to do more to put in regional strategies that will deliver skills and opportunities? Far too many young people are being left behind. James Dornan. I, I do accept that there are gaps that have to be filled. Of course there are. I mean, it would be, it would be foolish to, to not recognise that. But these two things are separate things, because if what you're suggesting is that the college places as well would have done what you're asking for, Mr Early, then I, I, I do not believe that's the case. Well, you're much more likely to get those gaps filled with the college places as are just now, that the, the government have put in place. Should there be more? Show me the money, as, as, as they say in, in the movies. We... Uh, Christine McKelvey, uh, in, in a very, very good contribution, talked about uh, the, the, the film I, Daniel Blake, which I've not seen yet, and I'm scared to go unless I take my hankies with me, but the, talked about un, being unemployed and the difficulties that created. I was unemployed in the 80s, and I have to tell you, I didn't enjoy it one second. I would hate to be unemployed today. I would absolutely hate it. And I would hate any of my family to be unemployed. My son works in the building trade. He was made redundant a while ago. He's working and has been pretty much steadily since. But for a short period of time, he wasn't. If he was unemployed during this time with your government in control, I would be worried every single night because there seems to be no thought for the impact of your decisions on the individual. And you ought to be thinking much more about that than looking for an amendment that, that plays a game political games with, with, with what is a, a motion that you agree with. Graham Simpson was uh, talked about that, but they, I, I listened to all the Tory speakers, and sometimes I wonder, I joined the Scottish National Party for two reasons. One is because I wanted to create a better Scotland, and the other is that because I believe in independence. But the only party, the only party in this place that has talked about independence is AIM. You know, independence. That all you do, every single speaker, honestly, the last speaker came up and we went, bingo, bingo. Every single one of you mentioned independence. Well, let me tell you, just for the record, I'm with you. Independence is coming. You may be worried about it. I'm really looking forward to it. And I think it will make for a much fairer Scotland. Oh, I'm happily. <laughs> Time. <laughs> Graham Simpson. I, I'm so grateful. Um, is, <laughs> is, is the member uh, unaware that uh, a draft... Uh, referendum bill has just been published. The people that are go banging on about this are your side. James Dornan. I, I, I love this because they say it like we're meant to go, no. Seriously. Of course we support independence. What we're trying to say is that is our core belief. But see, while we believe in independence, we're getting on with the day job. You, you're fixated in the cause of independence. Could the member just so, use the expression, the members opposite, not you, uh, because nobody oh, knows you're referring to. Presiding officer, the last time you gave me into trouble for calling him a mob, now you're giving me into trouble know, for calling him I know him. you're capable of polishing <laughs> your act. My apologies, presiding officer. Two areas, I use a fair term of endearment in Glasgow. Uh, two areas that I would, I was wanting to concentrate on, but they gave me so much ammunition that I couldn't really get around to it, is, is both early years in education and uh, LGBT. And I think that both of those uh, areas are ones that we have to take very seriously. I'm delighted with the role that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament has taken in making Scotland a much more fair, fairer and inclusive place because we have got that groundbreaking um, the, the legislation put in place. We have been leading the way in this. And Michael Matheson's statement, the Cabinet Secretary's statement today, in the week of the pretty disgraceful show down in Westminster, uh, really does show that Scotland already is that fair place, although it still can be a fairer place. So I'm really, really delighted with what has happened there. We have to make sure that, that uh, in terms of education, particularly uh, when we're still talking about LGBT, that teachers are trained appropriately, that teachers understand the difference. This is a much more fluid world. I'm, I'm an old man, uh, and I still I struggle to come to, uh, to grips with the terminology sometimes, but everybody has a right to live their lives as they want to live their lives. And we have to make sure that the professionals that we're dealing with uh, are aware of, of the changes that are made and are ready for them at all times. The early years in education, the, it's clear, as a convener of education, I'm absolutely delighted with the, the commitment that the, the Cabinet Secretary has shown to closing the attainment gap. Somebody mentioned the attainment gap earlier on, a few of you have. And of course the attainment gap's there, but that's why we've made it a priority. 
None of these things are going to happen overnight. And none of these things happen in isolation. My colleague, uh, Ben McPherson there, talked about the lack of context of your amendment and every single one of your contributions. Not one of you seem to recognise the damage that you have done. The damage that you're doing to the people of Scotland, the damage you're doing to, to the future of Scotland, unless we can get some way to... We, we spend three million, £300 million... In, yes, this is yes. quite lively. Yes, Mr Tompkins. <laughs> You're, you're, you're very generous, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the member for, for giving way. Could, I'm, I'm puzzled, though, uh, uh, Mr. Dorn, and I wonder if you, I wonder, wonder if the member could explain how, given that education has been devolved in its entirety since 1999, it is the United Kingdom government's responsibility somehow that there is a growing and problematic attainment gap in education, specifically in Scotland. This is the responsibility of the Scottish government, not the responsibility of the United Kingdom, surely. Mr. Dornan. I thank you for that question because that's a very, very good question and the answer to it is quite simple and this is what I found out since I became convener of the education committee that the, and, and skills committee that I never really quite picked up on before attainment is not all about what you learn in the classroom attainment is about what you have to bring with you to the classroom when you're living in a house in poverty when you've got parents that are maybe third generation unemployed when they don't recognize the benefits of education for themselves because their parents never benefited from it and neither did theirs so this is not this did not start in 1999 and it certainly never started in 2007 it's been going on for a long long time and I have to tell you, you might not be surprised at this, Westminster's at the core of all these problems. We are having to, £300 million pounds we've had to spend that we could have spent elsewhere mitigating the, 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 the problems that you're giving to Scotland. So why, are, why have we got an attainment gap? Because we do not have people going to school on a level playing field or anything like a level playing field. And until such times as we've got all the powers and not 15%, which you seem to think is more than adequate, then we will not be able to get it. Education does not stand on its own. And if it did, then that would be a different thing entirely. And do you, sorry, can, can I ask Professor Tompkins? Uh, no, I'm going to ask you please to wind up. You've made a, had a fair whack at it. Right, OK. Thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, all, what I would say to Professor Tompkins then is that School does not stand on its own. School is part of society. The society that people live in determines the sort of pupil that they are when they go to school in the very early years. So do not pretend that education has been in the remit of this government for 1999, so all the results of education is, a, a, is down to this government, because it's about the society we live in, and much of that, unfortunately, has been, put, uh, has been on your shoulders and not ours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Dornan. You livened the debate. Uh, I have to say I have a list of reprobates here, Jenny Gilruth, Tom Arthur and Polly McNeill, all of whom were in the open debate who are not in the chamber. I have no doubt they will send to the presiding officer suitable explanations as of to order, why they're not could, here. Could I have a point of order, please, presiding officer? Uh, Can I just check, is reprobates OK but mobs not? Yes. When I say everything's OK. <laughs> I now move on to closing speeches. I call Alison Johnson to wind up, please, for the Green Party. You've got an extra minute. Eight minutes, please, Ms Johnson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. In my closing contribution, I'd like to address some of the points raised in the course of the debate. Um, I'd like to discuss measures to tackle child poverty, the importance and the importance of the role that the NHS can play in reducing poverty too, and hopefully with time, a fairer carers allowance system. It's clear this afternoon there has been much consensus across the Chamber on the need for more action to create a fairer Scotland. There has been much agreement. Um, there hasn't been quite as much agreement on who's discussing independence the most, but I feel fairly certain that if one checks the official report tomorrow, the evidence will suggest that the Conservatives win that prize this afternoon. Um, I very much welcome the Scottish Government's proposed child poverty bill and the pledge to reinstate income targets, because if these targets are met, we will have made major strides towards a fairer Scotland. But this will, of course, require change far beyond those envisaged in the 50 Fairer Scotland actions. Christina McKelvey spoke of the importance of ensuring that human rights are at the centre of Scottish life, and I couldn't agree more. I welcome to George Adams' comments regarding a good food nation and the comments Ben McPherson made about a, food, a, a fair food fund. And he spoke of the excellent work occurring in this very city with crops and pots in the Granton Community Garden. And Elaine Smith too, who's long been an advocate, I think we need to heed her calls for a greater focus on breastfeeding. Because child poverty and food sits at the heart of a fairer Scottish nation. A third of the people depending on food banks in this country are children. 
And Nourish Scotland's report, Living is More Important Than Surviving, found that we don't have good data on the number of children in Scotland living with food security, with food insecurity. Children who either don't have enough to eat or don't know whether they'll have enough to eat. And it shows that children as young as five have an understanding of food insecurity. And this, this inadequate nutrition and anxiety about hunger have a profound effect on their development and ability to learn. I'm sure we'd all agree that that is indisputed and that we won't achieve our aims regarding attainment and closing the attainment gap without making sure that the children in our schools are not hungry. So we need to be really clear that people have a right to nutritious food and to embed this principle in our legislation. And the Fair Food Fund has an important role to play. But to ensure families are at risk of poverty, we need to make sure that those families are always able to access good food and we have to improve their incomes in order to do so. In June this year, the Scottish Government's Independent Working Group on Food Poverty urged the Government to build income maximisation support into mainstream services at key points of financial pressures on households and to roll out models like healthier, wealthier children. Very much welcome this approach. But one of the quickest and most effective ways we can take children out of poverty is to use, use the new powers we have to top up benefits by increasing child benefit by £5 a week. Um, Alex Rowley referred to this in his contribution. £5 a week, this could lift 30,000 children out of poverty. The Child Poverty Action Group and the Scottish Greens have called for this, and so has the government's independent working group on child poverty. And we need to do this urgently because by 2020, it's predicted that child benefit will have lost 28% of its value compared to 2010. Um, the Scottish Green Party has advocated a young carers allowance for young people with significant caring responsibilities. And I'm very glad to see the Scottish Government consulting on this in the social security consultation that does, as Christina McKelvey mentioned, close this Friday. And I look forward to hearing the government's response because there are at least 30,000 young carers in Scotland, and this may well be an underestimate. We know that caring can be very stressful. It's still undervalued by society, and young people struggling to meet the demands of school and the needs of the person they care for can find that their own health suffers, including their mental health. And I'm glad to see that the Children's Commissioner is developing new research, fo focusing on the needs of this often overlooked group. A young carer's allowance providing direct financial support will do a great deal to relieve the financial stress that too many young carers live with now, and it will acknowledge the value of the care that they give. I'd like to speak further to the section of my motion amendment that calls for poverty reduction to be part of NHS targets. The review of NHS targets offers opportunities to be bold in our aim for our health services. With the ongoing integration of health and social care, we can do more to ensure our health service tackles inequality and disadvantage and doesn't just, it's not just there to mitigate the effects of inequality and disadvantage. And many health professions have argued that the, the heat targets are too focused on short-term processes when we need to do more to deliver long-term change. And we know that inequality is deeply linked to health outcomes. So it's time that action on poverty reduction is reflected more fully in NHS targets. Because currently, no quality outcome indicators and no local delivery plan standards provide a way of measuring steps NHS services are taking to reduce health inequalities by improving access to services, delivering more equal health outcomes, or by tackling poverty. Reducing health inequalities is one of the Scottish Government's stated health and social care outcomes, and I welcome this very much. But none of the Government's 23 indicators show how health and social care services will actually deliver this. And this is not to say that excellent work isn't being done in many of these areas. Clearly it is. Or that we don't have the data we need to measure progress. But it isn't often applied to long-term targets. It's clear that the NHS, NHS services can tackle poverty. The Healthier Wealthier Children project is a clear demonstration. It's helped secure over £11 million in benefits for vulnerable families. Financial inclusion can be everyday business in our NHS and local services and I'm glad that NHS Health Scotland has committed to developing national referral pathways between NHS services and money advice services. But these need to be well-developed, reliable referrals, not just signposting, because we know that signposting doesn't work well for marginalised groups and those who feel most excluded. 
Presiding officer, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity today to debate how we can create a fairer Scotland. And I do hope there'll be many more such opportunities over the next four and a half years. There's clearly consensus between all parties on some of the ways forward, perhaps less on others. But whatever the different views held in different parts of the chamber, it's right that we're discussing how we use all the powers of this parliament, which are increasingly significant towards this end. And I, along with the rest of the Green Group of MSPs, look forward to contributing to this debate by showing how Holyrood can exercise its powers boldly and radically to create a better and fairer Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call, call Mark Griffin to wind up for Labour. Eight minutes or thereabouts, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I, I welcome the debate today and the publication of the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. It's been a well-read document in my house. I'm not satisfied with our building blocks. Even my 11-month-old daughter had a go at it, and you can see uh, the results here. The, the government can count on the support of this side in the chamber when it comes to concrete action to reduce poverty and inequalities. I welcome the 50 fairness actions for this term of the parliament as a way of tackling the issues and keeping track of progress, which we believe should be in the form of an annual report to parliament. And I'm glad that the government have agreed to that. We also look forward to the details of how the plan will be funded and supported in the upcoming budget. I think that will be um, crucial. I'd like to concentrate uh, my remarks on some of the individual pledges. Um, Action 19 and 48 refer to benefit entitlement generally and benefit entitlement for older people specifically. And given that the bulk of the spend on social security is reserved and so the costs of a move towards a 100% claiming rate would largely fall on reserve budgets. It makes complete sense in simple economic and budgetary terms that the Scottish Government should do all it can to drive this as hard as possible. Now, aside from the economic reasons which would see millions pumped directly into local economies, there is the much more important human reason and the impact this could have on reducing inequalities and poverty. On tax credits alone, more than 100,000 people don't claim what they're entitled to. £428 million pounds in working tax credit and child tax credit goes unclaimed. And we've called on the government to use the newly devolved powers in the forthcoming Social Security Bill to set a legal duty to increase awareness and uptake of Social Security benefits in general. That call builds on a key recommendation of the Scottish Government's poverty advisor to ensure people claim the benefits that they are entitled to. Local authorities and third sector welfare rights organisations already struggling with millions of pounds of cuts deliver extensive income maximisation programmes helping to tackle poverty and inequalities right across Scotland. But just now, there's no statutory duty to publicise social security benefits. Publicity drives can be done by individual local authorities on an ad hoc basis, but there's no responsibility to do so. Making sure in law that cash goes to the people who are entitled to it could make a huge difference to thousands of families across Scotland who are struggling and could boost local economies. And I think as well as maximising the number of people who are entitled to social security payments receive them, we should also look at who within the household is receiving those payments. And that's mentioned briefly in action point 17, where there's a reference to considering whether split payments could be offered as a choice. And split payments for universal credit is an issue which is of utmost importance and is something that has been raised um, with the Minister in the Social Security Committee and was supported by the committee in the previous session of Parliament. And to quote from Engender, the, the Scottish Government's pledge that new powers will be founded on dignity and respect will be undermined from the outset if Social Security cannot be accessed equally by women. 
if family universal credit payments are paid to the male in the household, what then for the financial independence of women? How confident would a woman be in leaving an abusive relationship when they know that the family universal credit payments are made to their abusive partner? What will be the impact on children's well-being when studies repeatedly highlight the link between women's access to income and reducing child poverty? The government should look seriously um, at making split payments for benefits related to children or caring to the lead carer and the remainder being split between a couple. Now, action point 17, that same action point, also chimes with the call from MND Scotland and other organisations who represent people with long-term conditions or a terminal illness, a point raised eloquently and admirably by Christina McKelvey, and they're calling on the Scottish Government to ensure people with motor neuron disease will be able to access certain benefits without assessment for the rest of their life, certainly. I, I Mr Balfour, sorry. I don't know whether the member has read the present social security legislation, but that already gives either the a department or the tribunal making the decision to make a lifetime award. It is there, and over 20 years of sitting on DLA and PIP tribunals, we often gave lifetime awards. What needs to change? Mr Griffin. Well, there's clearly something that needs to change since we're hearing of case studies, people giving personal testimony of having to go through a reassessment, people who are waiting so long for an award that actually they pass away before they even get their entitlement. That, that's something that is, that is clear. It's a personal testimony that maybe the member should take a look at MND Scotland's website, would see the personal testimonies there and see that there is a problem that remains to be fixed. And I would hope that the government and all parties indeed would commit to looking at that and, and addressing that. Now, I don't think without foundation that the MND Scotland are, are calling on the government to ensure people with motor neuron disease will be able to access certain benefits without assessment for the rest of their lives. And the government's consultation on the future of social security in Scotland is asking if some people should be automatically entitled to benefits. Now, that could mean that people with certain conditions would receive benefits without having to go through a standard application or assessment. That would mean a reduction in red tape and costs, reduced stress for people waiting on a claim being processed, and hopefully, hopefully eliminate that terrible situation where a person waiting on the support they're entitled to dies before they receive their entitlement. As Craig Stockton, the Chief Executive of MND Scotland said, benefits are not a perk of being ill. They're a necessary payment to help people with MND deal with the financial implications that invariably come from having such a disabling med medical condition. We should recognise that and not ask people who have been given such a devastating diagnosis to go through an assessment process or even worse to go through a reassessment process when it's a rapidly progressing terminal illness. President officer, I hope alongside our support that the government will take on board what Labour speakers have said today in terms of strengthening the actions that they have set out in the report um, and how we can improve progress through regular reporting to Parliament and ask members to support the amendment in the name of Alex Riley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Griffin. Well, Liam Kerr to wind up the Conservatives' 10 minutes or thereabouts. Mr Kerr. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 10 minutes, 10 minutes in which the Chamber is watching carefully to see whether I can resist adopting a particular stance. <laughs> if I can avoid taking a robust, strong and yet opening and welcoming position in order to avoid giving George Adam a hot flush. Yet, in a debate headlined Building a Fairer Scotland, it takes all of us, in which the motion is fundamentally agreeable. The only stance possible is collaborative and conciliatory. As we have heard this afternoon, everyone here believes that fairness should be integral to everything that this place and this government seeks to achieve. No one would disagree that all sectors of society should work together to build a stronger, more inclusive country. No one 
would disagree with people's right to buy <clears throat> and own their own warm and affordable home, whilst recognising that many people simply cannot afford to get onto the property ladder. No one would disagree that our economy should work for everyone to eradicate child poverty, to ensure that everyone has equal opportunity. In fact, everyone here recognises a simple truth, that it is time, no, it's long overdue, perhaps nine years, for this government to start to build a Scotland that works for everyone. And we welcome, yes, of course, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder what the member has to say about his uh, government in London scrapping key elements of the child poverty legislation, trying to sweep child poverty under the carpet uh, by abolishing statutory income targets. And would he not accept that the cuts uh, to child tax credits since 2010 will be a major driver in the explosion of child poverty that we will see by 2020 with 100,000 more Scottish children uh, put into poverty as a result of his government's actions? Mr Kerr. I don't recognise that at all and I also don't recognise, as I'll come to later in this uh, submission, why we are harping on about the Westminster government when we are here to debate this from the Scottish government to talk about what the Scottish government can and should be doing going forward. <laughs> now we welcome the Fairer Scotland Action Plan and its 50 fairness actions for the current parliamentary session. Angela Constance is right in her motion when she says it takes all of us, it will take all sectors of society to work together to build a stronger, more inclusive country. For this country to truly be fair, for our ambition to truly be met with reality, we must work together. For a united country is a fairer country and one that can work for all. Unfortunately, in this paper, A Fairer Scotland, there is a distinct lack of the ambition and resolve needed to actually create that society. Before you even get past page one of the introduction, Angela Constance is already cursing the UK government and attempts to take Scotland out of Europe, which has brought us further economic uncertainty. Please, enough of the airbrushing from history the one million who voted leave in Scotland. 36% of SNP voters, I believe. I was not one of them. But I am staggered that this government continues to willfully and divisively pretend that either those leavers do not exist or somehow did not know what they were voting for simply because this government disagrees with the outcome. That is not working together. And then, as Graham Simpson said, there's the constant blaming of the Tories and the Westminster for all the ills of the world. I panicked earlier. I thought I'd come to the wrong debate when Alex Rowley was speaking and when Christina McKelvey were just focusing on Tories and Westminster. We hear constantly about the Tory Brexit. George Adam blaming the Tories about the disability employment rate, despite it being 6.5% lower in Scotland than in the wider UK. Now, Edwin Morgan, uh, Edwin Morgan appeared in Time for Reflection earlier. And at the opening of this parliament, he wrote, a nest of fierties is what they do not want. A symposium of procrastinators is what they do not want. A phalanx of forelock tuggers, tuggers is what they do not want. And perhaps, above all, the droopy mantra of it was ne me is what they do not want. Well, enough of the it was ne me. Take responsibility. It is not Westminster's fault. Uh, I'll give way to George Adam. Mr Adam. I know the member has uh, uh, odd time. He's, he likes to kind of do the time warp when he puts his hands in his hips. But can we actually say, is he living in another planet or dimension even? Because... Is he not taking responsibility for the fact that I mentioned in my speech that under your watch, disabled 48% of all disabled people in Scotland are living in poverty? Take on your responsibility. Mr Kerr. George Adam may be happy to take a jump to the left, but I rarely am. The <laughs> reality is that the disability employment in Scotland has fallen significantly as a result of the SNP since 2007. 
If anyone needs to take responsibility, Mr. Adam, I'm afraid it is this government. It is not Westminster's fault that the number of women aged 18 to 24 in work across the UK has increased by 2.8% since May 2007, whilst it fell 4.2% in Scotland. It is not Westminster's fault that Scotland's employment rate remains lower than the UK's and lower than when the SNP first came to office. It is not Westminster's fault that economic inactivity is higher in Scotland than in the UK. And it is not Westminster's fault, as Alison Harris brought in, that bursary support for students in Scotland has almost halved in the last five years. Now, I'm sure we can all accept that the Joseph Rowntree Foundation were right, that the best way out of poverty, the best way to a fair society is jobs. And they are also surely right to suggest, as Adam Tompkins highlights in the amendment, that the narrow reliance upon income measures to identify households in or at risk of poverty is insufficient. Wider factors such as deprivation and the costs households face must be used in poverty measurement. As Annie Wells said, this government has the powers to achieve all that the motion wants. Alison Johnston and Elaine Smith made, made that clear. Now, we don't agree with the methodology, but we do agree the powers are here. So let's use them as the amendment craves to address Scotland's poor employment growth rate and Scotland's high inactivity rate. Blaming the UK for things you don't like is not working together. And let's not be distracted and suffer the negative drag on the Scottish economy and Scotland's ambition caused by an unwanted, unnecessary, unproductive referendum. That is not working together. Just last week, leading accountancy firms warned that companies will leave Scotland, graduates will seek work elsewhere, Scotland's economy will suffer, not because of Brexit, as Jean Freeman suggested at the outset, not because of Westminster, but because of this government's punitive tax plans. A strong economy will boost public spending, making Scotland the highest taxed part of the UK will not. It simply cannot be right that in Inverurie, in White Hills, in the Geary, perhaps more than half of residents are about to see a council tax rise, raiding them for £9 million to fund other parts of the country, whilst both Aberdeen and the Shire remain the lowest funded local authorities in Scotland. That is not fair. Will the member take an intervention? I shall. <laughs> I've lost my and I hope it doesn't happen again. Yes, Mr I'm, Simpson. I'm, I'm grateful to uh, Liam Kerr. Um, would, would Liam Kerr agree with me that the uh, Scottish Government's proposals on council tax are an attack on local accountability and that their constant cuts to council budgets, uh, as Alex Rowley said earlier, uh, do nothing to alleviate poverty? Now, Mr Simpson, you've taken Mr Kennedy's last minute. I unequivocally agree with Graham Simpson on that, and I think the point deserves to be made for the record. Uh, look, into my last minute, we all want to make Scotland a fairer place to live and work. The motion is a good one, but it must be amended as we propose. Will any member allow the people of Scotland to see that they did not vote for an amendment which calls for the taking more seriously of racial and religious prejudice? to give these matters a higher profile than is the case in the government's action plan? Will any member allow the people of Scotland to see that they didn't vote for a more decentralised Scotland with greater power and control handed to our towns, cities and communities? Will any member allow the people of Scotland to see uh, that they didn't vote for an amendment which calls for an acceptance that we must confront the underlying causes of poverty. To vote against or abstain from our amendment is surely to put party prejudice over prudence, expediency over ethicality, and self-interest over Scotland's interest. For all of these reasons, I commend the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Amendment to the Chamber. And thank you very much, Mr Kerr. Call Jean Freeman to wind up the government till 4.59, please, uh, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. This government is fully committed to tackling poverty and inequality, and our Fairer Scotland Action Plan makes that absolutely clear, backed as it is by a major funding boost of a new £29 million fund for communities and the third sector. As the Cabinet Secretary said in her opening remarks, tackling poverty 
is the job for all of Scotland. Every bit of the public sector, this government, local government, and all of us as individuals. And I'm grateful for the many positive uh, contributions that I've heard during this debate from across the chamber. And I want to deal with some of them in some detail. Can I turn to the contribution made uh, by Ms Johnston in putting forward the Green Amendment? And I have to say that I would agree very much with many of the points she made on both uh, social security and child poverty. And indeed, the point about citizens' income is an interesting idea well worth further consideration. But I know that she recognises, as I do, that with 25% of tax powers and 15% of social security powers, we are very far away from being able to make that any kind of reality. And I also agree that in terms of the public sector, across the public sector, signing up to this agenda, and with respect to her points on health, I do believe that Sir Harry Burns, who is currently reviewing our health targets, mm -hmm. will be mindful of the connection that he has long expressed and that I agree with fully between uh, ill health and the impact of poverty. But on the point about taxation, I have to remind the Chamber that our income tax proposals on which we were elected and for which we have a mandate are, are proposals which protect low and middle income families and at the same time generate extra revenue of around 1.2 billion in cumulative revenues by 21-22. And to Mr Kerr, I really don't believe that asking for higher tax earners to forgo a tax cut is unfair. In fact, it feels to me like a very fair proposition indeed. Mm -hmm. Turning to uh, the amendment uh, put forward to us uh, from Labour, an amendment which we are very happy to accept, I absolutely welcome the comments and the approach um, made by Mr Rowley and the approach that he took. And I would say to him that the plan itself, whilst one that we are absolutely committed to driving forward, is not the end of the matter. And other comments and other contributions will be very welcome receive, welcomely received. And while I agree that critical to all of this is, of course, public sector reform, I'm afraid I, I do feel that he is still failing to recognise the reality that this government's budget will have been cut by 10.6% across a decade. And also to recognise too that our procurement reform bill for the first time includes a living wage requirement and that we did indeed argue for employ employment powers in the Smith Commission, but unfortunately we did not receive all the support that we might have wanted in order to secure that. Finally, let me turn to the Conservative Amendment. It feels to me a very great pity, presiding officer, that Mr Tomkins and his colleagues has chosen to ignore not only the approach that we are taking in the Fairer Scotland plan, Action Plan, which is to address actions across the whole of government, but to join up the dots in what we are doing across the whole of government. So, for example, he doesn't seem to have read our economic strategy, nor to recognise that we have a race equality framework that specifically supports faith and belief equality, nor to recognise the Community Empowerment Act, which very specifically looks to hand powers to local communities and individuals in those local communities. And how unfortunate that in all of his 10 minutes, he had so little, if anything, to say about tackling income inequality and economic inequality. You know, I have to say, to the point about how we keep harping on, about Westminster. We harp on about Westminster because actually the primary causes of poverty and inequality in Scotland rest at the hands of a Tory government in Westminster. <laughs> hands of a Tory government that, can I remind you, you told us we would all be better together. Well, can he say that very many people in Scotland are finding that to be a reality? And my last point on this question is this, and it is to Ms Wells. Can I repeat that our track record on gender, the gender pay gap is significantly better than the UK's? I understand that it is handy to be uh, discriminating in the statistics that you might use, but it is helpful to be accurate in them. And in our uh, gender pay gap, 
we now sit at around 7.3% compared to the UK at 9.4%. Yep. Presiding officer, let me repeat our absolute commitment to delivering on the Fairer, Fairer Scotland Action Plan. In welcoming the plan, Jamie Livingston of Oxfam, Scotland said, it urgently needs to move from paper to practice in order to reduce poverty. And I couldn't agree with him more. We need more than fine words. And that's why we have no intention as a government of allowing this action plan to languish on the shelf. But although we need more than words, language is important. The Cabinet Secretary said earlier that poverty can lead to people experiencing marginalisation and discrimination. And where does that stem from? Attitudes that have hardened under the rhetoric of a Tory government at Westminster, a government that has chosen to give tax breaks to the rich, sanction and put caps on those benefits, those on benefits, chosen to sell off social housing and increase rents, and yet impose the bedroom tax. A Tory government at Westminster that will reduce yet further the benefit cap in the next two weeks or so, increasing by six times the number of families and individuals in Scotland who will be affected with that. And all the while deflecting from the real hardship of their ideology and its policies by using the language of strivers versus strivers. Indeed, in the Tory amendment, it is apparently the fault of those with addiction involved in the anguish of family breakdown and who are, I cannot believe, believe this Victorian word, workless, that lies at the heart of what poverty is about. Let me make it crystal clear. We will never, as a government, stoop to divisive language, setting one group against another or belittling and diminishing those who need our collective help to live the lives that they deserve. Orwell said, language corrupts thought and the language we use is important. And that is why we have emphasised the importance of our language in terms of the Social Security Bill. The powers that will come to us will be powers that provide us with a significant opportunity to take a different path from the UK government, to harness those powers, I'm sorry, I have very little time, those powers to our values and support people, not on the basis of dogma, but on the basis of compassion, compassion ambition and action. So we'll set the tone from the start with our new social security system, and we will have the principles of dignity and respect at the heart and alive in everything that we do. But we also need to be clear about the things we can't do, all the wrongs being visited on the people of Scotland that we cannot yet make right. Since May, I've been listening to people affected across this Scotland. I've heard much that is wrong and unfair in the current system. And where those benefits are being dev devolved, we will make those changes. And I'm grateful to organisations like MND, to Inclusion, to Gla the Glasgow Disability Alliance and to others for drawing those important matters to our attention. But where we don't have the powers, we will continue to advocate hard for the changes that are necessary. And having heard about the issues around people who are not fit for work, <coughs> being unable to get employment and support allowance, people having their benefits sanctioned and forced to turn to food banks, and the current shameful UK debacle on tax credits so cruelly inflicted on people, I can only say how much I dearly wish we had 100% of the social security system devolved to this Scottish Parliament so we could put dignity and fairness at its heart. <laughs> Presiding officer, we start from a strong track record of delivery. We've appointed again the independent poverty advisor on poverty and inequality. We acted quickly on child poverty, bringing forward clear proposals for a child poverty bill for Scotland. We will commence the relevant provisions of the Equality Act 2010 to introduce a social economic duty, supporting in its way the no wrong door approach. Both of these are unique to Scotland, showing that we are leading the way in terms of fairness and equality. Presiding officer, Scotland is leading the way in creating a fairer country, and that is something we can all be proud of if we work together to make it happen. I commend our motion to Parliament. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on building a fairer Scotland.
Move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 2057 in the name of Claire Adamson on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on a standing orders change to First Minister's question time. I call on Claire Adamson to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointment Committee is proposing some changes to the rules on First Minister's question time. Since the start of the parliamentary session, the presiding officer has trialled changes to the format of First Minister's questions. Up to eight questions are being selected instead of six, and the time for First Minister's questions has been extended from up to 30 minutes to up to 45 minutes. On the 6th of October, the presiding officer wrote to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau asking us to revise starting orders to make these changes permanent. The committee's view is that the revised format for First Minister's questions is an improvement on the previous arrangements. We believe there is cross-party support for amending standard orders to allow the new format to continue in the future. The relatively limited changes to standing orders we are proposing today will allow this to happen, and I'm pleased to move motion S5M 02057 in my name. Thank you. And the question on the motion will be put at decision time. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 2077.1 in the name of Adam Tompkins, which seeks to amend motion number 2077 in the name of Angela Constance on building a fairer Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Parliament will move to uh, vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote is as follows, yes 34, no 90, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 2077.2 in the name of Alex Rowley, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that amendment 207.3 in the name of Alison Johnson, which seeks to amend motion number 277 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. Parliament will move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Alison Johnson is as follows. Yes, 34. No, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that the motion uh, 2077 in the name of Angela Constance as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 2057 in the name of Claire Adamson on a standing orders change be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business. And I'll take a few moments to change chairs.